So it's my turn to take over here, right? <laughs> okay, well, I hope everyone is looking forward to this as much as I am. That's an unusual topic, and uh, some people have asked me why I chose this topic, and I actually didn't. I was just invited to speak about it, and uh, it sounded like a very interesting topic because I'd never spoken about this before. I do lecture about a, a wide range of health topics, everything from mental health physical health and allergies and thyroid. But uh, this is something I haven't spoken about, so it's going to be a lot of fun. And at my age, 78, it's a good time to take a look at this because uh, in just 22 years, I'll be 100 years old. So I have good chances of reaching 100 and going beyond, but it's probably time to already start thinking about it. So I have uh, prepared a uh, PowerPoint program. I I find it's a very good uh, in this uh, Zoom setting because then I don't forget anything. And as I've understood now, uh, there's no time limits on this one, so I can really just uh, take it easy and go through everything. I tend to uh, speak fast when I do these programs because I try to get a lot of information into a short time. And so this will be a really relaxed uh, time together because I'm just going to talk at my normal speed and there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, just so one I'll just interrupt, or I'll just interrupt for a moment to say that any of you who are looking forward to Carl Ferre sharing the platform together with Steve, he's asked if he could postpone his appearance and he'll reschedule as soon as he can. I mean, no good reason. So uh, that gives Steve plenty of time to be relaxed. Okay. And um, before I begin, I'd like to quote one of my favorite authors. That was Alan Watts, who was a, uh, a Christian pastor who became the first or one of the first uh, Westerners recognized as a Zen Roshi master, Zen Buddhist master. And he said, to grasp all the things that are beyond the realm of our worldly life, we would need the combined power of 20 brains. So um, since I only have one brain, anything I say, of course, will be limited and uh, a bit of my speculation, uh, but it certainly is a, uh, I think a good uh, a foundation for a discussion about this uh, very uh, interesting subject. So a bit about myself first, uh, you can hear I'm from North America originally, but I've spent most of my adult life living in Europe and now the last 22 years or so, half the year in Australia. So I do get around. And um, I'm going to talk about some things this evening that kind of relate to me personally because I felt driven to do some of the things that I do really early in life. And I think that there was uh, a meaning for that. Um, so this is... a uh, something that I began early. Um, I became interested in yoga, and yoga gave me a lot of interesting insights into Eastern thought. And I began uh, experimenting with different uh, detox in, and uh, cleansing methods of yoga. And then along came macrobiotics uh, 50, almost 53 years ago. And I uh, just immediately was uh, mesmerized by it. I found that my body responded to macrobiotic food, to the balance of energies that macrobiotics uh, is about. And here I am after all these years, um, I haven't seen a doctor once since I began my macrobiotic journey. Uh, some people would think I'm bragging, but actually it's just the natural consequence of eating the kind of food and living the kind of life that the human body is meant to do. And then it takes over itself. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been as frustrated as I have been through the whole, uh, let's say, the hysteria of the pandemic of the last few years, that there was hardly a mention of natural immunity, uh, which there should be, because natural immunity is much better than all these uh, concoctions that uh, the medical establishment comes up with. And uh, we're still hearing about these problems now, it's still not settled. And I've gone through this whole time with no fear at all, no need for any kind of medical intervention, and um, feel like this is all just part of the life that I started many years ago. 
Um, macrobiotics has uh, been uh, my main focus of my professional life too, because I do professional uh, health coaching. And I worked for some years in Germany at a medical clinic dealing especially with cancer patients and gave me a special kind of, let's say, slant on macrobiotics, which is also looking at the biochemistry of the body and things like minerals and vitamins, which are very important. Uh, so that's a bit of my background, but this time I'm not gonna be going into that kind of thing. We're gonna look more about the, the overview because macrobiotics uh, really is about total health, optimal health. And the question is, what do we want to do with the health? Is it just to be healthy? And of course, it isn't just that. Health is the means to really experience life to its fullest. And when we see all the craziness going on in the world, we can be happy if we are you know, those lucky souls who can focus on our own development and helping others uh, to uh, move along the way because sickness really holds people back. Uh, Buddha, uh, was known as the compassionate one, having great compassion. And it's very difficult to have compassion for others when you're hurting yourself. You know, you're so involved with just managing your own situation, there's not a lot left over for, for compassion for others. When we're healthy, then we have that excess to, to be interested in helping others along the way. Um, I... Um, will probably speak, I don't know, about an hour. I haven't practiced this. I, I put these uh, slides together uh, just spontaneously, so we'll see where it goes. And uh, the good thing about Zoom is that if this gets to be too much, you can just click off and go do something else for a while if you don't disturb anyone. And uh, uh, with that, I think I'll go over to my PowerPoint program, hoping that the, uh, the uh, things work well here. See now if I can make this uh, work the way I want it to. Yeah, so there. Okay, now I've got to get back to uh, trying to get to the point where I can. Uh, here, let's see. Here we are. If this goes, no, I'm not doing that there now. That's not right. I'm going to get to the uh, point of sharing this. And uh, when I practice it, it works okay. Let's see, do you have to... Uh... Okay, so oh, after the uh, <laughs> slight uh, problem with the technical part, I've got my... PowerPoint program up. So this is called Life on the Way to the Transition Called Death. And this is macrobiotic insight into Dharma and Karma, especially a couple of things to look at. And we'll see what each of those are. So the transition called death. In other words, death isn't the end, it's a transition, what we're talking about. So first, of course, we want to ask, why are we focusing on death? Well, I would say that First of all, it's a good reminder that there's no time to waste because there's no guarantee that any of us will be here tomorrow. And uh, a wise man once said, or maybe more than one wise man has said uh, that uh, we should live life as if every day were our last day on earth. Then there's no wasting time. There's no uh, the usual things that kind of hold us back. But also uh, it's to focus on the intertwining of life and death because they go together. The moment we're born, we're already programmed to die. And because in our society, there's um, an aversion to death, there's a fear of death. Um, it's good to see that in the greater context so that we don't fear it. We see it as part of the cycle of nature. And the cycle of seasons is the one cycle which is reliable. We can all count on the seasons changing. Here in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment, we have uh, the leaves falling, or they have fallen, and that in American English is called fall. And it is uh, with the idea that the next spring is already on the horizon, which is the new birth. And this is what goes on day and night, summer and winter. Things are in cycles. 
So it seems also that looking at the, the soul, that we would also go in cycles rather than having a short blip of light and then kind of disappearing into nothing. So the idea is that everything flows, the flow of nature, the Tao, and our purpose is to just let go and not cling to anything. We don't cling to life, we can let it go. We don't cling to any one religion, which is often our parents' religion. Now, I began life um, growing up in a Jewish uh, breakaway sect called Christianity. <laughs> and um, I I was in the, uh, the uh, group that uh, did not uh, agree with the, uh, the Catholic idea that the, the Holy Father is a connection to God. So I was a, a Northern European Protestant. And I was satisfied with that because I thought it was kind of silly, the idea that a group of men get together and decide that someone else is now the, uh, the contact to God. Um, and that was fine, but I've always had an open mind. And then when I began with yoga and looking more at Eastern religion and Eastern thought, I became intrigued by the ideas of Eastern religion, which is a different focus than Western religion. Uh, in Western religion, we think of God as you know something separate, like we're all in a bag of skin, and we think of God as also kind of like a bag of skin because he could you know get angry with us or whatever. It's like separate from us. In the Eastern thought, uh, there's no limit to God. There's no there's no uh, personal limits there. It's just God is everywhere. So it's a different kind of religion. So I became interested in that and began reading Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism, and I found these subjects of karma and dharma and reincarnation very interesting, and so I didn't feel any kind of conflict with my Protestant uh, background um, from Christianity. So I would say that as a basis to go into the subject, we all need to overcome closed minds and have open minds. I'm sure that anyone following this program here is already pretty open-minded because these are kind of things that closed-minded people are not interested in, but uh, we do know closed-minded people around us. So um, the Taoist motto, the Taoist principle is Wu Wei, which means do nothing. It's also translated as without effort, and it just means go with the flow of nature. Uh, and I chose this for the title of my book. Uh, and... Um, so this is really it, but we know we're all going to die. And so we go with the flow and we have no, no uh, problem with that. We know our time will come. And when it comes, then we want to go uh, as is like with the leaves falling. We wouldn't try to keep the leaves from falling off the trees and we wouldn't try to stop ourselves from dying. So there it is, the great Tai Chi. That's this yin yang symbol in the middle there. I chose this uh, symbol for the book because it shows the dynamic movement involved in these uh, energies of yin and yang. Uh, usually we see a, a stable ball that um, doesn't have movement in it, but does show the, the opposite energies. The, the author or the, the artist that made this one, I thought, captured the real essence of the yin and yang and that they're really moving, and there's, there aren't those definite limits or, or borders that we would see. So it's for a longer, healthier life, and that's because if you follow the laws of the Tao, which is the natural order, then you will live longer, I mean, or so you have better chances of living longer. And that's, of course, the whole point. So let's look at Eastern wisdom for the West. So we have the natural order, Tao, which is cyclical. And as I mentioned before, the soul also has seasons. There's a, a young season, which is like uh, spring, and then the full adult time, summer, and then we go into the fall, which is the, later on in life, and then we, we're we coming towards the end of life, and then it starts all over again. So this is what we would think of as reincarnation. So it goes life, death, and then life again. So I borrowed something from Alan Watts again. I used to read uh, his books. I was fascinated by him. It's one of my introductions to Eastern thought, actually. He wrote a book called uh, uh, The Book on the Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are. And he used a very interesting word. He said, uh, 
if we have memory, looking at the cyclical nature of our existence, if there's memory, there's probably also forgettery. Now, for those for those that don't speak English as a native language, the word forgettery doesn't exist. That was his invention. So we have memory, forgettery, memory, forgettery. And of course, it means that if there is reincarnation, then uh, we really do need the forgettery. Imagine how difficult it would be to negotiate a life if you had the memories of several lifetimes before you, like violent deaths and all kinds of things that happened. Um, the, uh, the, the idea of reincarnation is more accepted than I actually thought. I looked up on the internet because I was interested that when I was preparing this, how many people actually believe in reincarnation? And the estimations in the Western world are 20 to 25 percent of the population believe that reincarnation is real, which is more than I thought. Uh, and um, it's basically like a chain of lives progressing towards perfection. And um, the, uh, the idea makes sense because if you think of uh, you're given a life and then you should make everything right in one life, but people have different circumstances. Some people may be born in a slum and have crime around them and they'll grow up, you know, seeing that as their reality. And we wouldn't expect them to have the same kind of progress in life that we'd see in someone who uh, has had, say, very spiritual parents who get them off in the right direction when they're young. So having different lives and being able to move along progressing towards perfection does make a lot of sense. Now, this has also been confirmed by children. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, heard about a very interesting television series from the US uh, that uh, was called The Ghost Inside My Child. So you can check it out on the internet. The Ghost Inside My Child. These are parents who explain how their children describe previous lives and they've actually gone into which is easy to know with the internet, they've gone in and actually confirmed the details that their children have spoken of. Um, also hypnosis. Uh, I once um, uh, met a uh, psychologist in Portland, Oregon. I'm from Oregon originally. I met a psychologist who was interested in this because I was actually getting to know, be known about uh, reincarnation because I read an article in the East West Journal in 1975, that's a macrobiotic journal at the time, and there was a special edition on reincarnation, and there was an exercise, a very simple exercise anyone could do, and so I um, read it, I came home from my job, and I looked, you know, came with the mail, I read this article, then my girlfriend came home, and um, I said, hey, this is interesting, let's try this, here, lie down on the, on the sofa, and we'll try it, so she did. She just come home from work too. And about 15 minutes later, she was drowning uh, when a dike broke in Holland. And uh, she was throwing herself around the uh, sofa as if she were really in the death throes of drowning. And this left an impression on me for sure. You know, this guy just opened up this magazine and was reading this, this uh, exercise. They do a very simple exercise. And I started doing this with a lot of people. And I, I got a reputation around uh, Portland, Oregon that... Uh, that I did this, so uh, a psychologist contacted me that he did hypnosis, like to help people stop smoking, and that when he did hypnosis with people, they would start talking about previous lives that they had lived, and this made him interested. Uh, also, Edgar Casey, many of you may know the great psychic Edgar Casey, uh, was a staunch Methodist and you know believer in just the way the Bible tells the story, and uh, he became convinced of reincarnation just by looking at his uh, um, uh, the results of what he did uh, with uh, the people that he was involved with, with his psychic ability. So um, uh, everything just points that way. I had no trouble believing that this was real, it was happening. And uh, I also had the chance to prove that because I had I'd been I spent a year in Germany as an exchange student before, and I knew things about German life that most Americans wouldn't know. And when people would tell me about lives in Germany, I could hear the detail they were telling, like you know some twenty year old American kid who's mostly interested in baseball, 
uh, you know, describing the details of life in northern Germany, which is different than southern Germany. For most Americans, Germany is like Lederhosen and the Hofbräuhaus in Munich and that kind of thing. And in northern Germany, they would wear wooden shoes and have thatched roofs on their houses, like in Denmark. And so I knew that he was really telling me something that uh, that he was seeing in his visions and not something that he just thought up. In any case, uh, it all uh, confirmed my uh, uh, suspicions that uh, reincarnation really happens. Then one evening I was driving home from Portland uh, and uh, I was listening to the radio and a, a doctor who has a website called NDERF, that's Near Death Experience Research Foundation, Dot org. Now, anyone who is dealing with the subject of death, I would recommend this because uh, this doctor has archived masses and masses of stories of people who have passed over the other side and then be then uh, retrieved back into life, like you know the heroic work of the emergency medical team. And instead of you slipping away, you come back. And I'm sure you've all heard of those things. There have been books written about them. Uh, but NDRF is, is a very, there are other near-death experience websites, but this one I, was the first one I found. And it's when you read these things, you see, first of all, people are so overwhelmed by the feeling of love on the other side that they don't want to come back. And then they're told, well, your time hasn't come yet. You, you go back. And well, but I want to, you know, but, you know, back to the world where you forget your card keys and things like that. I want to just stay here in this, uh, you know, wonderful world of uh, love and, and beauty. Uh, so, uh, also children, when children tell the stories, it's especially, uh, impressive because they have nothing they can, uh, you know, say, well, they believe in reincarnation, so they're, they're telling what they believe in, uh, but four-year-old children just have nothing like that. So there's something called the Akasha records, which is a cosmic memory field. It's somewhere. And if you can get in touch with this, now I am convinced that, the reincarnation exercise that I learned from the East West Journal uh, put these people in touch with the Akasha records because the detail that they would explain these other lives in. And the Akasha record is sometimes called the book of life. It's like a, a vibration that's encoded into our, into our spirit, into our soul. And these are previous lives that we've, we've experienced. And the best part about it is when you get involved in this kind of thing, there is no more fear of death. And that's a nice relief because there's so much fear of death. Imagine someone who is an atheist and believes that it's just this one short time and it's all over. That's a pretty grim thought when you die and have to leave all this behind rather than just switching gears. So... Now let's go to the next one. Whoop. Got stuck there. Oh, there we are. So here, Nostradamus is probably maybe known to some people. Al Stewart uh, had a song about Nostradamus prophecies back in the 70s. I thought Al Stewart was a great uh, song writer and singer. I think he probably has the highest IQ of any of the uh, pop singers of the time. Nostradamus prophecies, which were in quatrains, which mean there are four lines. And uh, he prophesied uh, Napoleon and Hitler and, you know, people who made a big uh, splash on history. Uh, but uh, I think that Nostradamus got in touch with the Akasha records somehow. He told, he said, uh, I, 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 I had a dream. I dreamed I stood alone and the veil of all the years uh, fell like a, see, and the veil of all the years fell from my eyes like a stone. That's the way it was. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, interesting stuff. Anyway, you can check him out if you're interested. So the role of reincarnation. Now, this is interesting because what I'm getting up to with this reincarnation is that the way we live our lives now is going to have a big impact on what happens when we leave this life. And we have something like the Dead, Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi texts, which you may be aware of, these old texts they found. These go back to a time when there was uh, the basic Jewish religion and the Christian uh, variation of that hadn't really 
gotten going yet. The, the Gnostics were some of the first people there. You know, there were no there was no talk about Jesus. It was like these were you know the basic, this the oldest religion, the Jewish religion, uh, just getting a new slant. And um, reincarnation was actually mentioned in these texts. Like the Bible, as we know it, is not something that was just handed down from God, of course. Uh, it was uh, put together by men, and it was censored. Some things they didn't want to have, they didn't put in there, and they just put this book together with different chapters that fit what they wanted to say. Reincarnation goes even back to ancient Greece. Socrates and Plato both uh, spoke about reincarnation. And in the 6th century, Christianity banned uh, the uh, reference of reincarnation. But not until the 6th century. Until then, it was still here about. The Jewish Kabbalists were also very interesting. They they spoke about, they still speak about, uh, soul transmigration. The idea is that a soul needs several lifetimes to correct itself, going for that point of uh, perfection or, or the way it should be. Uh, the Kabbalah is a, is a really interesting uh, uh, part of, of the Jewish religion and uh, of course, you know, it's, it's not something that's part of standard uh, Jewish thought, but it's well enough known that, uh, you know, it does it does have its uh, <clears throat> followers. And I find it to be extremely interesting because uh, Judaism is such an old religion. And so we have these things really going far back in, uh, in time. Then there's Dr. Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist who probably is the most influential in making reincarnation mainstream. Uh, he analyzed uh, thousands of children's cases of children speaking about previous lives and uh, you know confirmed that uh, they, they were not uh, just telling fantasies or fairy tales. They, they were actually <clears throat> speaking about former lives. <clears throat> I became interested in Paul Twitchell and Eckenkar about uh, what would be 40 years ago found that very interesting um, about how the soul balances karma. In other words, like the, the kind of things you do in life and the effect you have on others. And that when you get your balance of karma, you get far enough and you go into a state of basically uh, spiritual bliss where you no longer need uh, to be uh, to go back and do more lives to learn how to correct yourself. And especially interesting to me was also Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Uh, who wrote the book Reincarnation, The Missing Link in Christianity. She was the spiritual teacher of the Summit Lighthouse. Uh, I think it, the books I've read about reincarnation, I think hers is the best. And I had the uh, the pleasure of meeting her personally because she invited me to the Summit Lighthouse to lecture about macrobiotics because they consider the macrobiotic way of eating to be optimal for uh, the development of the soul. And uh, I found that quite refreshing because generally uh, the idea is that uh, the soul is one thing and the body is another. The body is ephemeral. The soul is eternal. So let's just focus on the soul, but that's not the way to do it. So let's look at a contrast to the Western concepts now. Let's imagine you have just this general idea that you're born and then when you die, uh, you can go into this dark everlasting nothingness we could call it uh you know that's really scary stuff everlasting nothingness uh anyone who's atheist will will think that way but even uh the standard like christian understanding is you know you you get judged by what you did in this life and uh you know it could be <laughs> worse than everlasting nothingness uh also when we see the uh the way medical the medical establishment they will put people on machines and keep them artificially alive just because there's some fear of death when it would be you know better to just let them go because you know it's it's pointless to just keep people alive on machines just because you don't want to let them die death is a natural part of the cycle uh being born is the be beginning of the the uh, trip to death also very important is the family mourning as death approaches you know we uh, like my mother is 96 years old now, almost 97. And when she dies, I'm not going to be mourning. And I think she's lived uh, 20 years almost beyond the average life expectancy. And uh, of course, she's going to die like we all are going to die. And when she dies, I will actually 
just be uh, happy that she was lucky to have so much of life and to have such a good life. Uh, but when people mourn, uh, if you see their, you know, someone is dying and the people around are very much uh, sad, it doesn't really give the person a good send off into the other side. You know, it should be more of a celebration of life. And of course, the heaven hell concept that we have in Christianity uh, is uh, after a single life isn't really logical when you think about it. Uh, I mean, you know, heaven, like you want to have, you know, just kind of like a static state of uh, rejoicing doesn't really sound very interesting. And uh, the hell concept, that's, uh, you know, that's also just uh, something that doesn't really uh, fit with the idea of an ever loving God. So there's a lot of problems with that. There are big holes in that whole idea. Next, I'd like to talk about Theosophy and Madame Blavatsky. Now, Theosophy was really a break. This is a Western look at Eastern mysticism. Madame Blavatsky, Helen Blavatsky, was the, uh, the uh, originator of that. She was inspired by Eastern mysticism. And this is where the Western thought First, got uh, going with the idea of reincarnation, karma, and was uh, quite a refreshing new uh, twist on things. So looking at theosophy, it's say death is a transition to a higher vibration. So it's just a vib you're vibrating at a higher level. And you saying you is actually just a moving stream of consciousness. That's what a soul is. And we could even do it metaphorically saying that new life arises from the ashes of the old. And doesn't that sound good? So then the next thing we ask is, why are we here? And as I mentioned before, I would suggest that it is to progress towards the perfection of the soul. And this takes several lifetimes. It's a big job. And with all of my faults, I'm sure that I need more than one lifetime to sort myself out. Also, we understand the interconnections of life. And this is uh, how we all are interconnected, that what we do affects others and how uh, we can uh, affect the, own, uh, the outcome of our own lives and, and our own state. Uh, understanding the, the connection between uh, body and mind, how the mind affects the body and the body affects the mind. These are often seen as separate uh, uh, factors in our, our health. Like, do you believe food is more important or is it stress? Well, when you eat well, you deal better with stress. You can't uh, separate those. And the, the most important thing to remember here is that what we do now and the way we live, that sets the groundwork for the coming afterlife. And that's very important. So there's no greater task that we have in this life than to prepare ourselves for what comes after. Now, here's the basic insight. That is that the body is the crucial vessel for us to prepare for the afterlife. And that means physical and mental health. Because if you're not mentally healthy, how are you going to be able to even focus on things like what comes after life? You know, this crazy guy who shot a lot of people uh, recently, uh, it happens all the time. These people are in such mentally chaotic state, they, they can't even manage their own lives. And uh, they certainly would not be able to have abstract ideas about what comes after that. And what we know is that um, a clear nervous system is what enables proper thinking. So how do we have a clear nervous system? Well, it's scientifically well established. You have to have stable glucose, in other words, blood sugar. If your blood sugar isn't balanced, you can't concentrate, you can't focus, and you can even get aggressive, uh, anxious, depressed. Uh, that's not the way to get yourself ready for the afterlife. Also, the mineral balance, having a magnesium deficiency will affect your thoughts, zinc deficiency. So what it comes down to is that food provides the nutrients needed for a stable nervous system. The nervous system is our connection between the body and the mind. I can remember uh, camping in the mountains of Oregon with my uh, grandparents when I was young, about 10 years old. My grandfather was very, uh, very good at outdoor things. 
And uh, that's uh, 60 some, well, almost 70 years ago. And that's all somewhere in the matter stored in my brain, uh, but that's all matter. And um, if they did an autopsy of me, there'd be my brain to look at, but all those, all those memories are still there. That's why the nervous system is so fascinating. It's the bridge between the body and the mind. And that's why it's so important that we eat well, because food is what will give us that balance in the nervous system. And of course, a lot goes on with that, but the food is the very basis. So Michio Kushi, one of my heroes, I have a lot to be uh, thankful to him for. Michio Kushmi took me under his wing and uh, showed me how to uh, do proper macrobiotic health coaching. I was preparing for a uh, very daunting job at a German medical clinic dealing with cancer patients and others. And I wanted to get more uh, experience behind me before I did that. And uh, Kushi kind, kindly uh, took me into his home and uh, gave me some uh, tutoring that went on for a couple of weeks and I felt much better uh, ready to take care of that. And Kushi uh, also did spiritual seminars. He, he recognized the importance of food for our spiritual growth. And he had an interesting concept of the three worlds. He said, the soul is first limited in the water world. That's the confines of the mother's womb. Very, very limited area. We know we can kick a bit in there, but uh, it's pretty much confined. And then when we're born, that's the end of the water world. And now we enter the air world. That's where we all are now. We're all here at the air world. Now we think of the possibilities we have in the air world compared to the water world. We see it's infinitely more. Like we can travel around the world and we can do this and that, all kinds of things we can do in the air world. And the point that Kushi made was that the air life uh, comes to an end. And when it does come to an end, it's important that the mother's food and lifestyle during the water world was optimal so that our chances of doing it right in the, in the air world will be great. And then what we do ourselves in the air world, that means healthy lifestyle with food, uh, meditation, exercise, breathing, the whole thing, sleep. Uh, then we make ourselves ready for the next transition, which is death. So birth is the end of the water world going to the air world. Death is the end of the air world going to the world of vibration. And the world of vibration is really interesting because this now has an infinite greater uh, possibility than we had with Earth, just like the air world on Earth was so much greater than the water world, our first one. So this is something where it is so great we can't even comprehend it all. So in other words, food and lifestyle will shape the progress that we can make in the world of vibration because we're preparing for it now with our bodies in the air world. So Michio Kushi, there he is, great man. Uh, that was one of his quotes. You can read that yourself. But it, we're talking about energies, about how the energy of nature and the infinite, infinite universe are absorbed to the food we eat, and that food transfers into our thoughts and actions. So we couldn't say it better than that. One peaceful world. Wouldn't we love to have that? So his teacher was George Osawa, also one of my heroes, Osawa. I love this picture of him because as a traditional uh, Japanese person, he was one of the first to really understand European culture. So here he is, you know, dressed up in his European clothes, uh, showing his uh, flexibility there. Uh, in fact, he, he wrote a book about the Western mentality because uh, Japanese people had very little experience with Westerners and, um, you know, we think differently than they do. And his book was actually mandatory reading for Japanese uh, officers in the uh, Second World War. Like, you know, know your enemy. <laughs> Another uh, good model to think of for this development and progress are the seven levels of judgment, which is a classic that many of you, I'm sure, know if you've uh, dealt with macrobiotics. Uh, Osawa uh, gave us this uh, uh, 
uh, let's say, model for how we develop in consciousness. And that is that we begin very basically in life with mechanical. And if we look at food as a as an example, we say that's like you're hungry, so you eat. I'm hungry, give me something to eat. That's mechanical. And then this goes on to the, the second level, which is sensory. I mean, now, you know, we're, we're experiencing things with our senses. Not only am I going to eat something because I'm hungry, but now I want to have something that tastes good. I like this kind of taste. I don't like that kind of taste. The third level is emotional. I've seen that uh, in uh, Sweden here, where I'm in Stockholm at the moment, um, that at Christmas, ham is the traditional Christmas food. And for many people, without ham, it's not really Christmas. That would be emotional kind of thinking, you know, because, you know, I don't eat ham and uh, I don't feel I, I suffer any kind of less of a holiday spirit because, uh, you know, I don't eat ham. But if you do get attached to those things, that's what is called emotional. Uh, analytical is the fourth phase. Now, the fourth phase is interesting because this is where the body begins to transcend the self. In the first three levels, it's all ego. It's about me. In the fourth level, analytical, now we're kind of looking outside of ourselves and checking things out. For an example, when I do uh, counseling, uh, it's always interesting to hear what level people are at when they when they respond to my my questions or to my suggestions. And if someone says, well, I, well, I want to eat that anyway because it tastes so good. And I say, yeah, but it's, that's going to feed your cancer. Yeah, but it tastes so good. That's someone who's really, uh, you know, stuck in level two. And level three was say, oh, but, you know, my mother always gave me that and it made me always feel so comforted. And, you know, I still like that. That would be emotional. But when you say at level four, if that's going to feed my cancer, I'm not going to eat it, of course. That's analytical thinking. And I find in my personal experience that uh, very few people actually are operating at the analytical level. It's mostly sensorial and emotional. But it really gets interesting here with social. Going to at social level, number five, there you no longer really differentiate between yourself and others. Like if others... If others aren't happy, I'm not happy. Uh, if you think of vegetarians, some vegetarians um, eat vegetarian because it's healthy. That's okay. That could be analytical. Others do it because they feel that um, if they take uh, the animal food, which is a a uh, a lot of plant food, like it takes a lot of grain and plant food to make the meat, that uh, I'm taking food away from people who are poor. So I'm going to have the plant-based food because I want to free up our resources so others can eat. That would be social kind of thinking. And philosophical number six is well, like macrobiotics. Things are yin and yang. We see the climates are cold, so we eat warm foods to balance the cold. That's the yang balancing the yin. That's a philosophical way of looking at things. And of course, number seven is freedom. And that's where we want to go is freedom, which... Uh, uh, or so called satori. Freedom is where you no longer have any kind of limits. You do more, it's like a spontaneous, uh, intuitive kind of thing you do. You do what's needed at the moment. So it's going beyond yourself and beyond this feeling of being a separate bag of skin. That's what we're talking about. So striving for intuitive freedom or satori, that's the goal. And all seven levels are included in that. So this is a level, we see a, a way of developing in life. So when life is over, we are now at the freedom level and we're not still, you know, sorry that we can't have Christmas ham. Now, Dharma. This is one of the words I had in the title. Dharma is your true calling. The word Dharma actually in Sanskrit means right direction or right living. But Dharma is actually your unique purpose. Like I found out my dharma is to travel through the world and teach macrobiotic help because that's what I do. And when I look back on my life, I can see that I was going that way. I started with yoga and detoxing things. I found macrobiotics. And first I was just getting it sorted out myself. And then I people were asking me how they could be helped. And I started helping them. And then it just grew and grew. And then in the end, here I am now after all these years uh, sharing my uh, information with uh, anyone who wants to listen. So that's my dharma. And if you, if you discover your dharma, this is a great blessing. 
because it's a unique purpose. I I have that unique uh, skill. Like everyone's got their own skills. They can do this and that. Uh, some people have, do it through music or art. And for me, my way of being creative is like doing a PowerPoint program. And I uh, like to just concentrate it down to the essence. What is the most important thing? The way we recognize our dharma is by having a heightened sense of wisdom and discernment, being able to discern what is right. And then we discover why were we sent to this life? And when you look at reincarnation, you discover that basically each life is that you're preparing for the next life. And um, the question is, why do you do this, take this life and not another life? It's going to be this one. Why are you going to these two parents? And what do you have to learn? So basically, um, Dharma means uh, just follow your passion, and that will take you there. But my passion is is this. So I'll sit on airplanes sometimes, and because I do so much teaching, I'd like to just sit quietly and read a book. But the person sitting next to me sees I'm eating some strange travel food, and so ask me about it. And so I will spend <laughs> a lot of time explaining all these things because I have a passion for explaining this. I know. This is this person's only chance to contact this information, so I'm happy to do it. So we we fulfill our dharma when we serve and help mankind. That's a very noble uh, uh, goal. And um, I hear I'd like to go in a little bit on Buddhism, the Buddhist path of arhat and bodhisattva. Now, if you look at uh, Buddhism, you'll see that. Uh, well, they're different thoughts, just like in the Jewish religion and Christianity, you have different different kinds of people thinking different thoughts. But one of the interesting, um, uh, you could say, uh, opposition things is the path of the Arhat or the path of the Bodhisattva. Now, the Arhat is totally focused on liberation, on that freedom, level seven that Osawa told us about. So his life is about liberation because when he frees his soul, he will have the the um, that kind of uh, spiritual power to help Amen. others. The, the Bodhisattva has compassion as number one. Both the Ahat and the Bodhisattva are in the path of spiritual progress, de developing towards that perfected soul. But for the Bodhisattva, the welfare of others always goes first. And uh, Kuan Yin, the uh, the great uh, Chinese uh, goddess of mercy, uh, was known as the great Bodhisattva. That she was going to do whatever it took to help other people. So I sometimes see this as uh, a bit. Now I, I wouldn't claim I'm on the path of Bodhisattva. You know, I have too many human faults for that. But but uh, there's a little bit of Bodhisattva when you do uh, macrobiotic counseling because uh, you know people will. Uh, uh, contact me from all over and I never tell someone I'm too busy because I know that I can help someone else. So there's like a, a millimeter of bodhisattva in, uh, in what I do on my path to, uh, to fulfill my dharma. So again, it's the liberation or compassion. That's what we're talking about. Ahat, liberation, bodhisattva, compassion. Both are good, of course. I, the bodhisattva to me seems to be uh, the higher path. Now, the path of the bodhisattva includes something called virya. Virya is physical strength and effort. So here it's not only that you have to meditate a lot and you have to go out and help other people. You have to have virya. And I think it's related to the words vigor, virile. Um, the idea here is that if you don't have physical strength, physical uh, prowess, it's very difficult to help others. And this is what's missing in a lot of the modern teachings of uh, Buddhism. Um, if we think at the time of Buddha, there was no ice cream, there was no chocolate. Uh, they didn't have to spend much time talking about that because there just weren't all of these weird things that could make people sick. So, you know, it was given some attention, but not so much. In our time, we need to spend more time on virya what we need to stay strong and what it takes to be a, a bodhisattva, let's say let's be on the bodhisattva path. So dharma is right living. It means like being in balance. 
and meditation is part of that. But meditation is very broad. You know, it can be uh, uh, prayer, uh, chanting. Chanting is especially uh, good because the decibels in and that kind of meditation has a much stronger effect than if we do silent meditation. Or you probably heard some of the Tibetan mantras. You know, we have a lot of Tibetan monks sitting in a hall and they're all chanting together. It's very powerful. Now, another um, thing I want to talk about is karma. Karma is action and reaction. So there's a lot of... Uh, Let's say confusion of what karma is. Let's say someone, you know, you say, uh, my ex-wife, you know, uh, you know, had a car wreck and got injured. I think that's that's her karma because she treated me so bad during the marriage. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, karma is not like that. Karma is, uh, it's like it's a lesson. It teaches us lessons, so we learn. We're supposed to learn from our mistakes, so we set things in motion. We have actions. So people who kill other people, uh, those are very serious actions, and they have very strong reactions. Uh, I, I sometimes think about some of these mass murderers who walk into schools and start shooting up children. You know, like what kind of karma they create uh, that they'll deal with on the other side, even if they kill themselves and think they got away with it. So the the key thing about karma is it's free will. In fact. Uh, it's like the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's where karma starts. Because if you don't do that, then the, there will be a reaction. And so then there's a, it's like a balance thing. You have to balance the karma. So those things that you've done that harm, you have to do other things that will balance that out, that are good. And um, again, it's not fatalistic thinking about, you know, it's just your karma. Karma is something with free will that can be changed at any time, and, and you know we want to do that. So some deeds are selfless, others are selfish. So there's good and bad karma. Now here's something I think really interesting that comes out of uh, the, uh, the Buddhist tradition. And that is that when you help and, and, and you heal, that you create good karma. In other words, this is the kind of actions that will be like a plus uh, for your soul. But if you harm, this is the negative. This is the bad karma. But here's where it gets really interesting to me. That is that self-harm is also bad karma. So someone who, let's say, abuses alcohol, they destroy their health. That is the karma of self-harm. Uh, someone who uh, takes drugs, you know, ends up you know, dying of an overdose of drugs. Very heavy karma of self-harm. But I would even say being a hardcore macrobiotic, I would say that even eating a lot of ice cream every day is a kind of self-harm. As I, I've i noticed, uh, I've had a lot of people, a lot of men with prostate cancer. It's the number one uh, cancer in Europe and the U.S. among men. And uh, how many times they have told me that they eat ice cream by the bucket. They just, they love it. And I, I started researching this and found that high calcium consumption is connected to prostate cancer. So, like lots of cheese, yogurt, the whole thing. But ice cream, of course, is made from uh, cow milk. So that's uh, an interesting thing. But that's a bad karma uh, to harm yourself. So positive karma is positive action. Love, kind, honest, compassion. Negative, anger, hatred, greed, violence. So the goal is to balance karma because it's not fixed. In fact, I would say karma changes about like the Dow Jones Industrial Average does. If you watch it during the day, uh, these figures just keep flipping back and forth, up and down, and depending on what kind of a day you're having, you know. <laughs> you hope the little uh, frail old lady across the street, you know, it just uh, gone up. So it's basically just mathematics. You uh, you do something bad, you want to atone for it. And when you when people recall previous lives, they sometimes find that bad things they've done, like killing someone. Uh, may take more than one life to balance out again. But so I wonder what happens to people like Al Capone, you know, and <laughs> that's pretty heavy karma there, being part of the Chicago Mafia. Um, so another point, now my book, it says 
uh, eating the Wu Wei for a healthy, healthier, longer life. And one of the good uh, results of that is that the longer you live, the more karma you can balance. But this means, of course, that you're eat, living a good life. You're doing good things because if you're doing bad things, it'd actually be better to die early because you're just creating bad karma. Uh, but I think most of us here that are interested in this subject sitting here are, are really tuned into what I'm talking about, that uh, we want to live longer so we can help more people. And that means that we balance more karma. And with the clear intuition that we get from this right living, we get connected to what's called our higher self. And the higher self, I think, is a is a very good concept. We have a higher consciousness that we can connect with when we're in balance. So the word religion actually means reconnecting. So there's actually a, I would call it a godlike, or we use the Latin word divine, uh, energy around us uh, that uh, we can connect to. And the, the idea of religion is to reconnect with that energy. And it's not just to go through a certain number of rituals or this and that, but it's really an, a, a connection that we can all uh, do by living the right way. And that's why we see many religions, maybe even most, have some kind of dietary uh, instruction or rules or uh, guidelines to follow at a certain time. Like Christians have Lent. And there's, you know, fasting, the, the, the Muslims have Ramadan. And, uh, you know, it's a time when uh, you will uh, change the way you're eating because it will have an effect on your soul, on your, your uh, spiritual energy. So there it is, awareness through higher self. And uh, I think I, I like to meditate. I do more mantra meditation than, uh, than silent meditation. I find that when I do silent meditation, I uh, get distracted. I start thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch or something. But when I do uh, mantra meditation, I focus on the uh, the words themselves. Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. And uh, the vibration of mantras uh, has an energy in itself. And uh, I can feel that energy. And it's a bit like having a well-balanced macrobiotic meal with brown rice and everything. So this is uh, this is the point to connect with the higher self, and I think that's also one of the great uh, advantages of now being seventy eight years old. I uh, I think I'm just maybe my imagination, but I think that I am actually getting better connected to my higher self because as the years go by, I find that the important things become uh, more important to me. Uh, spend more time thinking about these uh, ideas of what happens after I die. So now we'll come to this study of macrobiotics, one of my favorite subjects. So how do we get clear intuition? I would say it's by developing something called yang mind. Now yang is a focus. It's uh, very directed. It's disciplined. And uh, if we're going to walk the spiritual path, this means we have to have self-discipline and focus, because if we spontaneously do whatever, then we don't really move forward. So how do you get a young mind? First of all, you don't take things that are strong yin. Now, sugar is a good example. Macrobiotics, we recommend that you don't eat sugar. George Osawa, already 100 years ago, was telling people about the weakening effects of sugar. And... Um, I haven't eaten it uh, voluntarily in all the years I've been macrobiotic. I've for sure had it sometimes in some kind of sauce or something along the way. But if I know that there's sugar in something, like try these uh, this jam, you know, I don't eat sugar. Yeah, but there's just very little sugar in this jam. Well, a little sugar is too much for me, so I won't try the jam. But if you eat like 50 kilos of sugar a year, which is... Well, the estimates are 40 to 70 kilos of sugar a year. No one knows exactly how much. And many of us don't eat any sugar at all. Uh, this will create a yin mind. That means more scattered, not focused, not disciplined. Now, there's a time to be relaxed and kind of scattered. But if you want to make spiritual progress, you really need to focus and take time every day for those things that will bring you far forward. 
one of who's taking time to cook good food. And if we think of what intuition is, intuition is something yin. It doesn't, yin is an abstract kind of energy. Something yang would be like, say, the wind. You can feel the wind, it just blasts in your face. You can't see it, but you can feel it. It's got substance. Intuition comes softly and uh, it's it's delicate and you have to be able to sense that. And that's, that's, that's yin. So just like masculinity attracts femininity, so yang and, and yin attract each other, and the yang mind will then attract yin intuition. So in other words, you wouldn't say, uh, I'm going to go uh, drink beer at the pub, and I'll be back to meditate with you later on. You know, the, uh, the alcohol will already cause a scattered brain, and so the meditation will be worthless. Do something else. Drink dandelion root tea before you're going to meditate. That's something that would give the yang mind. So then looking at it another way, yin and yang are always interesting to look at. If we say we have plant-based food is a light kind of food, and it makes us receptive to the energy flow from the universe. Whereas meat has a very dense energy, and it slows it down. So we're constantly being bathed by this energy from the universe. And if we eat plant-based food, then that energy will flow through us without stagnation. In oriental medicine, stagnation is considered to be the basic cause of illness. Uh, traditional Chinese uh, doctors would say, water can flow a thousand miles and it's always fresh, but as soon as it lands in a puddle, it suddenly becomes foul because stagnation creates uh, problems. So that water is no longer something to drink if it's been standing around in a puddle. Well, that's what happens to the body when we have density. And I would myself uh, include cheese, like hard cheese is something that creates a lot of density in the body as well as meat. Um, that if you choose to do that, and of course that's a free will choice, you know, I'm not telling people not to do it, but if you're looking at it from the point of view of yin and yang, if you want to make spiritual progress, then you will need to do more meditation to create that flow so you'll move better through the density that meat creates. Now, that doesn't mean that every piece of meat you eat would be a problem. I'm not saying that, you know, this, I'm not talking about a you know, radical diet here. What I'm talking about is meat generally creates density, so don't have much of that, is what I'm saying. And if you eat none, you can, you can do it without also, but for some people, that's too uh, radical. So a mantra, which is a yin, which is, you know, om mani padme hum, uh, that is a good way to balance the density of the yang. So if I were to eat meat, as has happened, um, when I'm invited along the way, if it's good quality, I have done it, doesn't happen often, but it has, has happened, um, then I will uh, do mantras because I know that the mantras will create the flow again that gets slowed down. We could also say that macrobiotic food is very much like of the traditional Eastern adepts, the sages, the wise men of the East. And that uh, makes it so especially interesting. Uh, ketogenic food is a new invention, but it's really popular among young people now. And uh, in fact, a lot of young people have no idea even what macrobiotics is, but uh, it, uh, it doesn't have a tradition like uh, macrobiotic food is the kind of food people have eaten for ages. So here we have the balance of yin and yang in food. So we're always thinking about the balance now, because the balance in, in the food, as Michio Kushi told us, creates the balance in our bodies, and that balances with the universe, which is also a yin and yang uh, harmony. So this uh, picture I've taken from the cover of a book I wrote in German uh, in 1989. That was the year the Berlin Wall came down. And uh, I wrote in the book that the yang energy, the dense compact energy can be seen in whole grains. And the yin or expanded energy, the light relaxed energy can be seen in sprouts. So the graphics department of the publisher, Goldman in the Munich, they uh, created this uh, uh, image of yin and yang on the cover of the book. 
and it won a graphics award for the best book cover, graphics book cover for the uh, spring of 1989. They give this awards twice a year, once for spring and once for the fall editions. So they did a great job. They read the book and then they did this. When I wrote my English book, I was working with a publisher at the, at first and they thought they weren't going to make any money with my book. So they released me from the contract and I published it myself. Uh, they had some uh, professional uh, cover designer uh, give me a proposal for what the book should be. And it was... Uh, just a lot of colorful vegetables all over. And they were pretty, but about a quarter of them were nightshades. Now, nightshades are potatoes, tomatoes, bell peppers, uh, eggplant, chili, tobacco, and they all contain some form of nicotine. So macrobiotically speaking, we put them in the extreme group and say, don't have those very often. So the last thing I would want to have is a book cover full of these colorful but toxic vegetables. So it showed it really pays if you're going to be the graphics department to read the book before you design a cover. And here's a macrobiotic plate. So here we've got brown rice. And I'm sure many of you already know this, but I'm just showing this in case not everyone is, is familiar with this uh, way of eating. The beans are the protein. And you notice these are black beans. And I want to leave you today with the thought that black beans matter. Then we've also got broccoli, so greens, which are more of the yin kind of vegetables. Then we've got uh, squash and carrots. We know the young. And there's some seaweed there. Seaweed is very important because most people have a deficiency of minerals. And mineral deficiency makes it hard to think properly. So... It comes back to an original idea I brought up, which is that for spiritual progress, it's important to eat the right foods. And if you don't eat seaweed, it's very likely that you have a mineral deficiency. It's very hard to get those today, even with organic vegetables, to get enough minerals. Uh, seaweed is loaded with uh, what's right. Some people are afraid of them because of a toxic uh, potential there, but uh, when they are uh, resourced through organic food channels. They are well tested. They're well, you know, examined and there's no problem. So that's uh, nothing to worry about there. There's only one thing missing on this plate that I would say is very important for health. And that is there's no pickled vegetables. In other words, sauerkraut, uh, cucumbers, um, whatever, just sour because what really decides your health, both mental and physical, is your gut bacteria. It's that simple. Now, this insight is only about 10, 15 years old. This isn't uh, really, you know, uh, uh, well-established old stuff. This is uh, cutting-edge new stuff. We know that the way you uh, eat will determine your gut bacteria, and your gut bacteria will, through the vagus nerve, will influence your thoughts and your ability to think in a harmonious way or in a chaotic way. So imagine all the people taking antibiotics now. When you take antibiotics, it wipes out the gut bacteria. So it makes it very difficult to be healthy. Here in Stockholm, uh, the biggest uh, Swedish daily newspaper sent two journalists out to 10 doctors. They each went to 10 doctors and they told them that they, they were getting a cold and uh, it was slowing them down and they wanted to get some antibiotics because they had important things for their job and their career and they just couldn't afford to get uh, sick. Nine out of 10 doctors prescribed antibiotics. Now imagine, antibiotics cannot stop a viral infection. Antibiotics are for bacterial infections. Now, how can someone study medicine for all those years and then give someone a prescription for something that's going to weaken them? They're going to take this antibiotic and it's just going to wipe out their gut bacteria and they'll have absolutely no protection. In fact, it's going to make it more likely that they will suffer from the cold. So you've got to watch out for uh, the experts. Uh, anyone who lives macrobiotically is uh, skeptical of experts. 
So this is what I was talking about, balancing the inner and the outer. So with the food, we balance the our bodies. And with this, we can balance the energy around us. Like right now, I'm in Stockholm, Sweden. It's very gray, what uh, in, in Japanese we call yin ki. There's a, a very yin kind of gray, damp um, uh, unpleasantness in the air right now. This is not the best month of the year to be in Sweden. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, I will fly to Australia. And the summer starts there on the 1st of December. So I will switch from yin ki to yang ki. Yang ki is warm and sunny. And so I will also change what I'm eating because I need to eat one way to balance the yin ki of Sweden in November and a different kind of food to balance the yang ki of the Australian summer. So here, I'm almost done with my marathon now. Hang on with me here. Uh, these are called the three treasures which I think is a very good, uh, let's say in a nutshell, what we need to take away from this uh, understanding of Oriental wisdom. The three treasures, are, first of all, Shen. Shen is spirit. It's uh, located in the heart. This is, uh, in the Orient, people think of the center of you as your heart. Where, you know, we would think of like somewhere behind our eyes and our brain. Uh, they think of the heart as the center of the person. Now, this is spirit. And uh, our, this is the mind. So and if you read in the middle, it says, um, if we look at it in a Western way, we could say that Shen is the mind, Qi is the breathing, and Jing is the body or the physical uh, substance. So what I was just talking about with the macrobiotic food, that's Jing. And uh, if we have meditation, and proper thinking. In other words, we don't waste our time with chatter or gossip. Uh, we make it count. What we say, we make it count. Um, that's strong shen. And qi is the energy we get from having strong jing and strong shen. Qi is what keeps our body going. It's like it's an electric current. Like if I would end unplug the uh, computer now everything would go dark because uh this that, that's the energy that's keeping this computer going and the chi is what keeps us going and when we don't have much we become weak like uh, like a very poor uh electric source so you can read uh, some of these uh connections here like at the top calming the breathing the spirit gets centered abundant chi then gives you a powerful conscience. So we can see that uh, when you're when you've got the energy, it's going to fire your conscious, your consciousness. It's going to make you able to really take that leap into the unknown that comes beyond. And if you eat the proper food, that will strengthen the jing, which uh, according to the Chinese is in our kidneys. So we kidneys are a sign of uh, uh, let's say lacking jing because the kidneys are not strong enough to hold jing and of course chi is uh, that, that energy we have when everything is working well so then comes the concept of the astral plane now we'll see this in some of the teachings like the uh, Ekankar and uh, the Summit Lighthouse that uh, when you when you die you actually first of all uh, and encounter an energy field that's very close around. It's called the astral plane, which is kind of a chaotic energy. And what you want to do is make your your body so powerful at all levels, physically strong, mentally clear, have a spiritual vibration that's very high and clear, that when you die, your spirit will take a great leap through the astral plane into what's beyond that. Because the astral plane is a bit chaotic. I've seen a couple of really interesting uh, programs on TV. One was in uh, Germany several years ago when I worked at the clinic. Uh, a man who uh, liked to uh, drink at the pub with his friends, he got in the car and started driving home and he had an accident and he died. And he was suddenly out of his body and he and he met uh, some uh, 
men that came walking by and they told him that uh, they looked confused. Uh, come, you know, come with us. And he said, well, just leave me alone. I'm trying to get away. I don't know where I am. And they said, no, you really should come with us. And when he refused, they got more aggressive. And the end, he said, no, I'm not going with you. Then they started attacking him. One of them pulled his arm off and started beating him with his own arm. And uh, he then had this flash of, of crying out to God to help him. And when he said that, they told him they'd leave him alone. Just he shouldn't say that again. Then he was pulled back into his body because the emergency medical team saved him. And um, he's now a uh, minister, uh, a pastor. And he said that his drinking friends thought he just got a bad bump on his head because he had a total change in personality. Well, I found this story to be interesting. And then about three years ago, I read about an atheist in San Francisco who had a heart attack. And uh, he had a heart attack and died. He suddenly was standing there and a group of men came by and said, you look confused. You better come with us. And he said, no, no, leave me alone. <laughs> and it was the same story, except that this time, instead of ripping his arm off, suddenly one of them just uh, lunged at him and bit a piece of his body, uh, just took a chunk of his body out with a bite. And he did the same thing. He called out to God. And, um, and they immediately disappeared. So when I heard this second one, I was I thought, this idea of the astral plane, I think, really exists because what happened with these people, first of all, being in a state of intoxication with alcohol would prevent you from having that kind of power that you need to go through the astral plane and get out into the higher octaves, the higher levels of consciousness. And of course, being an atheist, you would have no idea of anything spiritual. And so he just landed there and the funny thing with him when he told his story was that uh, his friends in the atheist movement were really disappointed because he dropped out. <laughs> he got back from that uh, that trip. So that's the, the astral plane. And so people who abuse drugs, people who abuse alcohol, or people who get involved in things like Ouija boards, uh, spiritualistic things, uh, can end up in the astral plane. So what this means is that... When we go beyond the veil, we really don't know what comes. But what we want to do is balance karma by good works, helping others, doing being nice to ourselves, not harming ourselves, having a clear mind so that when we get old, we don't have dementia. If you have dementia, you'll have no power. You, you can't make that break through the, the, the astral plane. You need to have that power to go through it. And we can we can do it if we spend our lives uh, focused on that so we take that step beyond and then i'm sure that when we get beyond we'll be very surprised first of all what's all going on there and uh, that we will probably be um, uh, shown what our previous lives were why we lived the life we did and that uh, if we haven't balanced our karma so that we no, no, don't need any further earthly lives then we'll probably come back and uh, do it again. And hopefully the next time we'll learn more than we did last time so that we get better and better at it. So thanks for joining me. There's kind of my idea of what happens when we die. We just kind of float out there and uh, we want to keep ourselves very focused and young minds so that we uh, do everything right. If you uh, want to contact me, there's my email address. And um, I will go back to the uh, the picture here. Uh, let's see. Well, that was uh, quite a long one. I really enjoyed this because I didn't have to rush. Yeah, I usually would try to do that in an hour. I could have done it in an hour if I had been fast, but I took my time and just uh, smelled the roses on the way. <laughs> so... Where should we go from here? Should we uh, go into some questions and answers or discussion? How would you like to do that? Yeah, I think discussion sounds even better than Q&A. Uh, of course, both are welcome and maybe the same thing. Uh, several of us have been trying to unmute and I've been furiously remuting them. So <laughs> now's your chance. <laughs> uh, or anybody, I don't care. A good way to do this, since there's a lot of us, is if you want to raise your hand. And sometimes that'll put the hand 
sign up or sometimes you can on the bottom there. There it is. Michelle has raised her hand. And <laughs> let me just say, anybody who didn't figure that out, I think there's a hand raised button somewhere. And uh, okay, let's begin. <laughs> if you don't find it, let me know. But let me move this pin. There we go. Hey, that's me. Michelle, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Hi, hi Garnett. Nice to see you, Garnett. Nice to see you. And Stephen, nice to hear you. Um, I've heard you many times before. And I have a question um, when it comes to, I've been doing a lot of research lately when it comes to schizophrenia in the gut, the microbiome. Um, and I know macrobiotic diet addresses this and hypo, hypothyroid. So I'm thinking that's just a condition where it's not static beings. What would you say as far as, I don't know if this is in the line of the questions you want to answer today, but what would you say that is um, as far as spirituality is concerned and uh, what is, what's a way to fix that? Because more developing more into more schizophrenic could probably be uh, damaging the brain. So anyway, any thoughts? Thank you. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think the question is just fine. I, uh, you know, I'm very interested in food and uh, this connection. So I think the question is right in line with the, the topic. Um, what I've come to understand through the years is that the condition of the gut is really uh, decisive for how everything goes, whether it's uh, physical or mental. And uh, the two things that are most devastating to the gut microbiome, which is the word that we use for the gut bacteria, is first of all, milk protein, cow milk protein. Uh, it's mostly cow milk. It could be other animals, but that's the most common. And gluten, especially wheat gluten. Uh, Dr. William Davis wrote a very good book called uh, Wheat Belly, where he describes how wheat affects uh, the gut. I would recommend the book to anyone, Wheat Belly. It's uh, great reading. You You won't want to eat wheat when you've read that. And, uh, uh, it, it comes down to uh, the very basics in the gut. And it's, it's like this. Uh, when, when the gluten has contact to the uh, intestinal mucosa, uh, it inflames, it creates inflammation. And this inflammation, if it's happening regularly, like people eat wheat daily, uh, if it happens once, your body will recover, but if wheat is the most common food. Uh, when I was recently in the States, I found it hard to find a bread that didn't contain wheat. Even the rye bread was wheat and rye. So um, what happens is this inflammation uh, creates chaos in the gut lining because the... Uh, the gut lining is only one cell thick. So it's extremely fragile and it's protected by the mucosa. Without the mucosa, we would, we would be doomed. And um, so we have goblet cells in the gut lining, which create the mucus. And there's also uh, uh, a substance called zonulin, which is secreted that keeps everything going properly so that the cells will open up, they're called tight joints that open up, and they will allow nutrition through, but nothing else. And when this gets to be inflamed, now, of course, wheat gluten and, and milk protein are just uh, a start, you know, nightshades will do it too. So how about a cheese sandwich with a nice slice of tomato on it? <laughs> and, uh, so uh, when you take that, then uh, you get chaos. The zonion doesn't uh, work properly and the gaps uh, enlarge. So you, they get large so that now, not only nutrition gets through, but you get antigens coming through. You get pathogens, things like the gluten that get into the blood, and then you have inflammation coming. And the problem with this is that's a barrier. The gut is a barrier, but there's also a barrier called the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier uh, will let anything through that the intestinal barrier uh, lets through because you know it needs those nutrients. So when the gut barrier gets damaged, then you're now opening yourself up for a an in, uh, inflammation in the uh, as a reaction from the immune system, and these inflammatory substances will now go through the blood brain barrier, and the barrier is there because the blood the brain is extremely sensitive, and when these substances get in there, then they'll inflame the brain, and this is when you'll have things like schizophrenia, uh, just mental illness in general or even uh, 
dementia and Alzheimer's. So, you know, it, it's, uh, there is information. I, I used to read some of the uh, uh, scientific information from uh, research, uh, but this was before internet. I had a whole stack of paper about the effects of wheat gluten on schizophrenia. So as soon as you asked that question, that uh, that was found to actually uh, trigger it. So no one would say, you know, well, you know, how can just wheat create that? Well, someone it's when someone is sensitive and uh, let's say uh, vulnerable, because uh, I, I have a very good uh, gut system. If I eat wheat, I know not, I notice nothing other than that uh, it's a bit heavy, but I have no reaction. Uh, but the effect on other people who don't have that strong gut uh, will be that that can trigger it. And, um, you know, I think that uh, uh, psychiatry would be, get much further if they would pay attention to what's called nutritional psychiatry. It's a new branch of medicine. And it's like the experts are always the last to know. You know, we, we've known about this connection between food and the psyche for a long time, but psychiatrists haven't. They've been trying to imitate what doctors do, which is prescribe their, their patients out of their problems, and it doesn't work. What it does is uh, it accelerates their tendency to dementia. And what nutritional psychiatry now has discovered is that food is the most important factor in your psychiatric condition. And I think we're going to see some great things happening in the next years because of that, because it's it's like the dam is broken now and, and they're starting to understand it. First, they, that the, the failure of uh, conventional psychiatry and then now these insights that are coming from... Uh, psychiatrists who are you know thinking outside the box as they say yeah Thank I mean, you. I've, I've seen people uh, recover uh, from mental uh, problems many times by just changing their food and of course uh, wheat gluten is the worst but i would say if someone's got schizophrenia or even any kind of uh, severe mental problem i would cut out all gluten even rye and spelt because wheat gluten has made their gut so gluten sensitive that there are even reactions to harmless uh, gluten uh and uh, i find that oats work fine oats you know there's a lot of discussion about oats and gluten but i find that gluten sensitive people almost all of them do fine with oats and then of course rice and millet and quinoa buckwheat mm -hmm. there are plenty of other alternatives too but see good results with that and, uh, it's really mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see more of that in the future because uh um it's you know it's serious i read a really interesting book by uh uh, what was her name? Uh, there was a a uh, psychiatrist in Portland, Oregon, who wrote a book called uh, "The Crazy Makers." The Crazy Makers. It's really good. She noticed in her uh, clinical experience that uh, young people, especially, were getting crazier all the time. And she began researching and found that uh, there were thirteen uh, chemical toxins, neurochemical toxins, in baby food. That mm. when they were getting their baby food, you know, that they buy in jars all pureed, that when their brains were being <laughs> developed and their nervous system, they were getting all these toxins. Mm. And uh, uh, it's uh, just, you know, absolutely a, a shame. She said she was very pessimistic because she was seeing that the uh, more and more craziness with younger people. She'd been doing this many years. And those who are now a little, little older, they're, they're not as crazy as the younger ones coming up now. It's a a snowball effect. Mm. Yeah. Lastly, I just want to say that I did hear I did, now that now that you brought this up at another can at, at Denny's Waxman's, um, he had a, a big con, like online thing, and he had brought this doctor who said that it was eating too much meat that was ruining the lining in the intestine. That was get it's the meat eating. We're attracting microbiome that eats ourselves. That's what he said. Well, that's right too because the. Uh, we know that uh, when you, uh, it takes fiber to create a healthy microbiome and meat has no fiber, uh, no animal protein has no fiber. So if you eat meat once, you'll get away with it. But when it's meat every day, then you will create what's uh, called bacteroids. And bacteroids are the, uh, the, the harmful bacteria that are also called decay bacteria. And they will do exactly that. They will, they will cause harm. They also secrete things called lipopolysaccharides that are toxic. And they become part of the uh, the toxic load the body has to get rid of. When you eat carbohydrate, 
then you get the uh, the, the uh, fiber, and that's what the other uh, the good bacteria thrive on. And then they create the short chain fatty acids, and then they support the gut lining. And I mean, that's what I do, and I'm sure that's why I'm still doing so well. You know, I I just I just sometimes can hardly believe when I think of all these years of just unending health I've enjoyed. And mm. uh, how lucky I am that I, uh, you know, found this out at a young age. Mm. Thank you. Mm. So I've posted, uh, thanks, Michelle. I posted Steve's email address again. Someone wrote in the chat. There is another question before we get to you, Sylvia, just a moment here. And that question is, da 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 uh, someone asks, oh, could you say more about nightshades and nicotine? Uh, she didn't know that they, they were, she thought nightshades have solanine, but wasn't aware of nicotine. Yeah, sure. That's a good question because uh, I have found that when I do uh, macrobiotic coaching, uh, the nightshades are the most sensitive topic with people. You know, you'd think it'd be sugar, like giving up sugar. But when I tell people to stop eating tomatoes and potatoes, it's like they go into a state of shock. And uh, the point is that all nightshades are, are cousins. They all belong to one group of toxic plants and they all contain uh, glycoalkaloids and they're all a kind of nicotine. So nicotine is a close relative of solanine. So you have solanine in both the tomato and the potato. They used to call it tomatine and they discovered it's actually solanine. And I, I, I'm sure that this uh, resistance to giving them up is a bit like telling a smoker to stop smoking because uh, you know they just don't want to stop it. And uh, and you know, say it's, they're just these red things, you're not gonna eat them anymore. We'll eat some other things instead, but it's not that simple. <laughs> so first of all, uh, solanine, if we want to focus on that now, um, has a, a very uh, nasty effect on the body. It uh, creates uh, a lot of, uh, inflammation. And so when you study how people get sick and what makes them healthy again, we find that inflammation is the basic illness. Like when you eat non-organic food and you swallow the glyphosate and the pesticides, what do they do in the body? They inflame. They're not supposed to be there and they cause inflammation. Well, inflammation causes oxidation and oxidation is the basic illness. So if you're, you know, if you're oxidated, you'll get sick. Uh, a good book by Dr. Thomas Levy is called uh, Curing the Incurable. And he talks about vitamin C as a miracle cure because it basically will neutralize the oxidation created by all these toxins or other inflammatory substances. So uh, what I have found over the years is interesting. That is that uh, people who suffer from arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, they are the best witnesses to uh, speak about the inflammatory effect of nightshades because if they take them once, they will have an attack again of their pain that is gone. When I worked at the clinic in Germany, uh, it was mostly cancer patients, but we did have several rheumatoid arthritic patients and they were our best successes because the patient stayed for six weeks and you don't cure cancer in six weeks. You can certainly make an impression, but you can't stop it. Uh, it takes longer. But the rheumatoid arthritic patients, after six weeks, uh, many of them were totally uh, pain-free and, and symptom-free, and it made a big impression on everyone. In fact, the, uh, the, the administration of the clinic considered uh, having an apartment just for arthritis because they were seeing so many people uh, recovering. Well, that's, that's what does it, is getting rid of the nightshades. And we had so many people come to the clinic saying, well, I eat only organic food. I don't, I don't eat meat. You know, they're already doing, I don't eat sugar. They were doing these things that generally people would do to be healthy. But the one thing they don't do is stop nightshades. And that's why they never get better. So I can assure you there's a life after tomatoes and uh, potatoes. In fact, I found that the patients at the latest after three or four days would comment how uh, surprised they were that they had lost their attraction to potatoes and tomatoes. It, it takes just a few days to get to get over the addiction. Thank you, Steve. Um, 
Norio writes that he's been on a ketogenic diet for, I forgot quite how long, for a while. So we can hear about that. Uh, Sylvia, go ahead with your question. Uh, not a question. Uh, um, comment about schizophrenia. All of us know, remember, that George Osawa cured this in Africa. The groups that were developing schizophrenia and impossible for their family members to control, he discovered they were eating sugar, that they had access to imported sugar, whereas the rest of the group was eating a starch-based diet, a very small amount of meat from like monkey. But he said, okay, stop the sugar and instant cure for schizophrenia. And I can testify to this. I was a sugar addict in my younger decades. And it's the difference between life and death. It's the difference between finding one's purpose and being in a state of endless confusion. I wanted to tell Steve, I'm very thankful for the information he gave, the anecdotes he related about astral plane and how we are in greater jeopardy during transition if we are on like drinking or drugs. But this brings to mind what Herman taught, that even if it's a person is a few days or a few weeks away from their transition off of the physical plane, that it counts to eat clean. Because if you don't eat clean, if you're not doing clean core eating, they have you on painkillers. They have you on things that mess up your mind so that when you go into the astral plane, you can easily be diverted. You might even instantly want to be born again because of the fear of not being in a physical body. But by eating clean, then we would have more strength in that very disorienting point between life and death, in between. And so clean eating and staying away from painkillers, making it so that you don't need painkillers or things to make your mind so that you're drifting in and out and people are drifting in and out for months before they supposedly die of cancer, actually die of the treatment for cancer. But yeah, you don't want to go near that if you want to make a clean transition, a sensible transition, and not lose whatever gains you've made by the work on yourself using diet as a tool. The I could comment on several things, but also on the topic of karma. I'm reminding people that we have a collective karma as well as an individual karma. And at the collective level, groups experience the responses to past action. And in groups and individuals, we can't always identify what it was in this life that attracted this consequence. But if we remember something similar that we did to someone else that we are experiencing, then, then we'll know why we had to experience it. Because if we experience it, we won't want to do it again. And that's, you know, by accepting the consequence, by, by understanding Osawa's teaching that everything we have is what we deserve. In fact, it's more than we deserve. Anyway, yes, Steve made many good points. He and I are the same age and I'm thankful to him for being focused and giving it straight. Thank you, Gannat, for hosting. Yes, thank you, Sylvia. Always wonderful comments. Yeah, that was great. Anyone uh, else? It was fun to uh, see Sylvia. We're old uh, Facebook friends and <laughs> fun to see her live there. For, <laughs> except, you know, and uh, thank you for those uh, uh, compliments, uh, not, not, that, those complimentary uh, 
statements you made about uh, karma. So that's, that, those were all very good comments to, uh, you know, to uh, complement what I had said before. Comments, questions, here's your chance. Norio, do you want to fill us in? Hello. Selma, hi. Yeah, I can say I can say a few words if you like. Uh, can we I... see you, Norio? Can can we see uh, yeah. your video? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I can say a few things. Uh, yeah, I, I only mentioned it to you directly, you know, because I didn't, I don't, I, it's not, the intention is not to contradict Steve. I think it, what every, everything Steve presented is really incredibly useful. So uh, it's just uh, for myself, uh, for those of you who don't know, in August 2021, I was diagnosed with a rare cancer. Uh, Merkel cell carcinoma, which uh, was it a uh, cheeseburger in paradise the guy who wrote cheeseburger in paradise, Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> he uh, he recently passed away, supposedly from this cancer. So anyway, so um, uh, Gina and I we've had some conversations about this already the last couple of years, but uh. uh the, the only thing I know where I came from with this whole thing in, in looking at uh, the diagnosis is like Sergeant Schultz, if anyone who knows Sergeant Schultz, uh, Hogan's Heroes on TV, you know, I know nothing, I see nothing. You know, so, so that's the only thing that I was absolutely certain about is that, that I, you know, it's what Sergeant Searle says. <laughs> so anyway, um, so so I just looked at everything. I just looked at everything, and uh, and of course, naturally, the first thing I looked at was the way I was raised. Uh, and and uh, early on, once I realized in May of 2021 that what was happening, the the tumor, or what looked like a tumor, was probably carcinogenic or could be or whatever so malignant I guess is the word uh you know I, I returned to the way I ate as a child growing up uh but I, however the tumor continued to grow and so uh yeah I was you know willing to look at anything and, and 2022 was a real rough supposedly rough year um I I don't look at I mean, if I compare one day to the next, or one year to the next, I can say one's rougher than the other. But, but uh, I look at everything as just life, life, expression of life. And I didn't. And I, and growing up macrobiotically, I didn't. I don't see cancer as something negative, or you know, it's. it's I see it as an expression of some form, expression of life. Uh, and if any, and if if nothing else, it's the messenger, and uh, and not to be, and and we don't want to kill the messenger. So, uh, so so uh, I went to regular conventional Duke Cancer Research Center. I and I and my partner Lisa, she just researched all kinds of things, and we learned a lot of things and. She discovered a lot of things, and I tried many, many different things. And in January 2023, I went to see a doctor who recommended a keto diet, which to me was a shock. I, I was surprised, but I was totally open to it. You know, like I said, I, you know, I'm willing to try anything. And uh, what? Oh, and and the other thing to back up a little bit is. As most of you know, is that my sister, she was diagnosed and along with my mother with cervical cancer. And my dad, he also had colon cancer. So, and I have close friends who were diagnosed with cancer who ate macrobiotically and it didn't help them at all. And I have one close friend who actually 
passed away. Uh, and, and, you know, one of them living with me. Uh, so, so, so I'm not saying that it's not valuable. I'm, all I know is that I don't know. <laughs> so, so I said, okay. Uh, so I asked this doctor, Dr. Yu, uh, how long do you, do you, would you like me to stay on this keto diet? He said, two years. <laughs> I said, two years? <laughs> anyway, so, so I said, okay, no, no big deal. I can do it. You know, so, so that's, that's what, what prompted me to do the keto diet. And, and at that point, uh, my left leg was really swollen. I had a lot of pain. I started taking pain medicine, medication, which I had avoided. Uh, and, uh, and my energy level was very low. And uh, so, um, so once I switched to the keto diet in two days, uh, within five days, I should say, the swell, my swollen left leg went back to normal size. Uh, the, and then my energy level increased considerably. It doubled, but even though it was still very low compared to uh, what I remember prior to 20, the diagnosis. But uh, so, so I, I say that not because I, I'm not suggesting that's a, uh, uh, I'm not recommending it what I mean to say. I'm just sharing what I, what I did and and uh, and recent my recent PET scan in August 15th uh, showed that the the tumors that were throughout my lymph system uh, have a lot of them have disappeared and the ones that were left are now dormant. And uh, so that was, and I'll have another PET scan November 14th. And and even the, the tumors that I could feel near the surface of my skin, they're all now gone as well since that last August 15th PET scan. So, uh, and here again, it's, you know, I don't, <laughs> I just go with the flow <laughs> and appreciate every morning. I wake up every morning and just really appreciate it. And uh, so, yeah, so, and here, yeah. <laughs> uh, what so else even though, even though, <laughs> Norio, you're not recommending the keto diet, sounds like you're recommending the keto diet, at least for yourself, well, that you're attributing. Actually, uh, well, I, I'm telling you th this story. What, if, if I recommend anything, I recommend uh, not knowing. Uh, so, <laughs> well, not, not, but definitely not to follow the keto diet. I think, I think one has to come from a place of not knowing it and following. Yeah, it's interesting to hear, uh, uh, Norio, to hear your, your story there. Uh, I think the biggest mistake that macrobiotic people have made <clears throat> is assuming that uh, this way of eating covers all nutritional needs. See, macrobiotics came as a, uh, it's like a guideline based on food tradition. And um, what, what, what's right for the human body, but it doesn't tell us if we're getting enough omega-3 or vitamin D. And uh, my experience has been that vitamin D deficiency is a very common cause of cancer. And I think it's one of the, uh, the traps that happen to macrobiotic people because there was a resistance against taking supplements. And uh, yeah. what, what I have found is that uh, the macrobiotic food program, uh, as good as it is, it doesn't cover everything. I take supplements. I take vitamin D. I like hear in Sweden, uh, you know, we haven't seen the sun in a few days, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and even if it shows up, it's got no power at all. So, um, you know, if you don't take vitamin D, uh, you'll get a deficiency. Uh, vitamin D is actually a hormone. And the two most common deficiencies I've found in macrobiotic people, as well as other people, is omega-3 and uh, vitamin D. Uh, mm -hmm. I talked to Michio Kushi about this in 1990 when we had a macrobiotic teachers meeting in Miami. And I told him that working in the clinic, we were uh, 
using the German spectrometric whole blood test, which analyzes blood cells uh, much more uh, intensely than in a normal test. In fact, normal test doesn't even look at them, it looks at the serum. But uh, I told them that we were seeing uh, zinc deficiencies in macrobiotics that were uh, very similar to the general population. And uh, he was very stubborn about that, you know, <laughs> as we, all, <laughs> we who know Michio. <laughs> He said, no, uh, he refused to accept that if someone was really eating macrobiotic food, that there would not be a zinc deficiency. And this this is where, you know, uh, where they went wrong. because He got it right on many places, but they missed this very specific thing. And I have found uh, working with cancer patients a lot that when they do the macrobiotic program, but then also take the German spectrometric whole blood test. Now, this is available in the U.S. too now from Doctors Data in Chicago. They, uh, they went to Germany and learned how to do this. Uh, you can find out which minerals are missing, and uh, especially the vitamin D, which is actually a hormone. Like almost all cells in our body have vitamin D receptors. You can imagine what happens when you get too little. Uh, basically, 99% of the population has a vitamin D deficiency unless they're taking supplements. Or if you live in, you know, Miami and you go out every day at midday and uh, you know put on your swimming suit and then you know lie out in the sun for a while. Uh, unless you do that, you're going to get it even Miami. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that this is this was a real problem, uh, and I think this is where macrobiotics went wrong. And uh, you know, when I when I do counseling, I spend uh, probably a third of the time I talk to people, I talk about the supplements they need to take too. So there's <laughs> that one. But I think you're absolutely right that the, the macrobiotic food program, as it is, uh, is not strong enough to help most people. Uh, decisively it helps them but to really make the curve and so i think you know if you feel good with the keto program you know more power to you because just the standard macrobiotic thing is not going to be enough my my problem with keto is that it's such a low fiber uh program like if you do the the real hardcore keto you'll have at the most five percent carbohydrate which means very little uh fiber and that means that you know your gut bacteria will suffer uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. if you're really aware of this fiber issue, you can eat a lot of kale, you know, which is, doesn't have much carbohydrate, but a lot of fiber, you know, children don't want to eat kale, but if you, you know, if you got a purpose for it, you can, you can do it. Uh, you could still, you could still do it, but I would definitely uh, think about the fiber issue because of the importance of uh, the gut bacteria for recovery. But I certainly yeah. wish you well with that, you know, because I, I can just imagine what that's like. Uh, I think about that often when people come to me with cancer or what that would feel like, you know, looking at a, you know, a, a, a potentially fatal disease and how you deal with that. You know, it's a, it's a big, big thing to deal. Yeah. 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 I appreciate everything you say. And the, the, for me, uh, it it's never occurred to me that anything is wrong, quote wrong. You know, to me, it's all just it's all like a dance, and uh, and dancing with this and um yeah the uh, the uh, I, I probably don't I I would say that I probably don't even have five percent carbs. And you know I'm I'm willing to give it a shot you know and so far it seems to be beneficial yeah uh, and uh, and I and I'm also doing other things too I mean there's you know like uh, uh, breathing exercises and things like that I'm, mm -hmm. uh, every morning I go to hyperbaric chamber uh, treatments uh, uh, so there so. So it's, I can't say that. Yeah, but, you know, you know everybody uh, makes their own decision. That's right. And whatever you decide, yeah. no, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, the, the, one of the reservations I have about keto is that there's no long-term uh, study about, like, people who do this for several years, what happens? Because, you mm -hmm. know, it's a fairly new way of eating. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, uh, I don't know either. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, just wishing you all the best and, you know, take, <laughs> yeah. take, 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 if I were you, I'd take 20,000 units of vitamin D every day. That's what I would do. Okay. Which yeah, is Jan not as much yeah. as it sounds like. 
<laughs> yeah, January 19th, 2025 will be my two year anniversary. I'm going to enjoy a bowl of noodles and mochi. <laughs> 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 bowl of udon and mochi. <laughs> <laughs> Noria, yeah, we wish you the best. It's really a, yeah. a pleasure. It's Please kind of, keep uh, yeah, keep I, us updated. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, I, I I see it all the game. <laughs> Even time. something we don't really want is. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Marion, you have a, yeah. thank you. Everyone. If you're done, thank you, Noria. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hope to see you later tonight. You have a program with your brother with yeah interview with my brother two o'clock eastern time usa right thank you Marianne. Marianne. thank you so thank you for that talk it's been incredibly inspirational for me to hear all that uh the whole discussion has been just really fantastic and uh I have a question for you about sleep. I don't do, I'm not doing well with sleep and I'm wondering if you can help address that. Yeah, well, it's a very important thing. I think I like the pillars of health. Sleep is one of them. Uh, you know, I've seen people who are very sick and they take sleeping pills because they can't sleep if they don't take them. And I would say, you know, if it takes sleeping pills to sleep, you, you, you have to do it because if you lack sleep, your body can't heal itself. But uh, it's better to do it without the pills, of course. Now, the first thing is, do you take any caffeine? Uh, very little. It's it should okay. be zero. It should be zero. Not I one cup be. of coffee, not one cup of green tea, no chocolate, you know, nothing that's got uh, caffeine. Yeah, I don't do coffee or green tea, but I do some chocolate occasionally. Yeah, well, uh, that's better than uh, often. <laughs> Uh, but I know I know people who can't sleep after they've eaten just one little square of chocolate. People who are extremely caffeine sensitive. So that, that that's the first thing. Now, what we have is a dance between uh, cortisol and melatonin. You know these two hormones. And what you're basically telling me is that uh, you have uh, uh, difficulty with the uh, melatonin, and you have probably uh, too much cortisol. So there are several things like, is your bedroom totally black when you sleep? Like, you know, that we you can see absolutely nothing. Like if you open your eyes, you can't see where the dresser is or there's just nothing uh, to be seen except black. I can't, I can't see anything when I open my eyes, but I do have a nightlight on in the bathroom. And when I get up, I can see that under the door. And so I know where to walk in the middle of the night when I get up. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, as long as it's not visible when you're sleeping, that you know that that's okay. That's number number two is do you uh, do any uh, 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 screen time in the evening, like either computer or tele or television? Because the uh, yeah, you may know about this, but the uh, the blue light blockers are important because when you look at a screen, a TV screen or a computer screen. Uh, the blue light is telling you that it's the morning and it's time to, to be active. Uh, so they have these glasses. In fact, my uh, reading glasses have blue light, blue light blockers. So when I do uh, uh, screen time in the evening, I always have blue eye blockers because blue light will trick my body into thinking it's morning instead of evening. And so, you know, then it doesn't want to sleep. So it suppresses melatonin and... Uh, uh, enforces uh cortisol like that you know or when we wake up in the morning that's because cortisol starts rising and so we're sleeping you, in the evening melatonin is rising so when you say wear the blue blocker glasses is that for once it gets dark yeah that's right so and that, that's a really big thing because with the way life is they many of us like we'll check our emails in the evening or we'll watch tv and um, you know it's uh, it's become a, a real problem uh, with the blue light and blue eye blockers. Are, you can either get just standard blue eye block glasses, or you can have them built into your normal glasses. Uh, that's that's another thing. And then um, there's a question about like the way you put your food together. Like, what do you have for breakfast? Um, usually something like uh, grain, like maybe oatmeal. 
and then uh, some kind of green broccoli or kale or something like that. And that's it? Yeah, that's usually about as far as mm -hmm. I get with breakfast. Well, um, you see, when you've got a hormone imbalance, which you obviously have, then you want to think about all the hormones. Now, I mentioned vitamin D previously. That, that you, Do you take vitamin D? I do. How much do you take? Um, Roughly. 5,000 a day, probably. Um, that, that should be enough. Where do you live? In uh, Central Texas. Oh, yeah. Well, you should get enough uh, sun there so that 5,000 should do it. <laughs> and, uh, so that part's okay. Now, what you need, though, is to have protein and oil together with carbohydrate. So basically, you're having a carbohydrate breakfast, but you don't have the protein and oil to balance that. So that means that insulin starts uh, going up and down. You get uh, some imbalance there and that will affect all your hormones because hormone balance means everything's where it should be and as soon as one thing gets out of balance it affects everything else so when's your last meal um usually about six seven o'clock and when do you go to bed um about nine or ten mm -hmm. yeah well um you would do well in any case to eat a light meal in the evening, uh, nothing heavy then. Do you have a lunch? Uh, I usually. Yeah, I was thinking if you can make your lunch a major meal and the evening meal lighter, because when you eat a large meal in the evening, you're basically giving your body a message that now it's time to work and you know, digest, and uh, there's less of the quiet time and the peaceful time going into the evening's rest. And uh, a three hours is a, is a minimum between eating food or stopping the meal and then going to bed. I would say when you're having sleep disturbances, even, you know, push it to like four hours. Uh, so like don't exactly. eat at seven in the evening if it's, if it's all possible to always like try to, if you're at home and have the possibility, stop eating at about six, six fifteen, about that time. And then you'll have four hours before you go to bed. That will also help. And then now, I get, by then, by the time I go to sleep, then I'm really hungry. Yeah, well, see, that shows you're not having enough protein and oil. Because uh, if you get hungry within four hours after a meal, you, you don't, there's not enough substance in the food. Okay. Now, looking at facial diagnosis, I can see that you have a pancreatic weakness. And uh, this means that... Uh, you probably have some insulin issues going on there. But uh, what you you need to have substance. Now, for me, substance means um, pulses, legumes, right? chickpeas, beans, lentils. Of course, it's possible, you know, to have animal protein. Sometimes they eat fish sometimes. You know, that's okay, too. But generally, it's, uh, it's beans or the protein. Uh, tempeh is okay too. Uh, if you know, if, if you like tempeh, I I only I, I slice it thin and and fry it. That's the only way I like tempeh. I, I don't like the taste of tempeh otherwise. Uh, yeah. Also, I prefer tempeh that's made from other beans than soybeans. So I get like chickpea tempeh and black bean tempeh. Those are good. But in any case, uh, you need to have more substance so that after four hours you don't feel like you need to eat something. Okay. Uh, I think that's going to be the real key. Now, of course, this has got a, you know a lot of issues to it, but that's where you need to start. And I think the the whole composition of your meals should be uh, looked at here because this is to me a case of uh, too light. There's too much of the grain or too much of the the, the carbohydrate and not enough fat and protein. Uh, you, you know, like eating olives will help. You know, olives, uh, nuts, and uh, seeds like pumpkin seeds of course they should be soaked in salt water first because they contain enzyme inhibitors so they nuts and seeds that haven't been soaked will tend to tax the pancreas and uh, that's just what you don't need huh. yeah i usually put nuts or seeds on my grains 
but I haven't soaked them. Yeah, well, yeah, try soaking. Um, you can dry them after if you have a lot of them, because if you soak them, they'll mold after a couple of days if you haven't dried them after that. That's, uh, yeah, but uh, that helps. But what you really need is to have the beans, uh, you know, soaked properly, uh, you know, and having this, the, uh, the foam that comes up when you cook them up, getting rid of the foam, cutting that off, so they're easily digestible. That's uh, that's where you want to go with that. So Marion, let me uh, thank you. And uh, I want to bring in Selma. You haven't spoken if you'd like to ask your question. I see you, Sylvia and Michelle, it's just Selma's not spoken yet. And uh, Yuta also, okay. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to uh, thank you for your, your talk and the, uh, and I wanted to share that my daughter, she's now 33, but when she was really tiny and uh, she started speaking, speaking, she she would explain about the sky and the different um like shavot, I don't, shavot, uh, the, the layers of the sky and what were the colors. And it was very uh, intense, like it seemed that she was she knew something that was not from here, you know? Yeah. I, I always took it very seriously and I I was amazed and uh, excited about her stories about, um, she would say, I love you, mommy, like the skies. And then I would ask about the sky and she would start talking about the sky and she knew all the colors and what would go before what. And it was really neat to watch <laughs> and to hear. So that was one. And the other thing is now that you told the uh, Marion about soaking with salt, I always soak and and dry my all of my all of my nuts. Uh, but I never use salt. I only use water. So I'm interested about that and if it's specific for Marion because what you saw. Yeah, the uh, soaking in salt accelerates the uh removal of the uh, enzyme inhibitors. Yes. Because uh, if you eat nuts that haven't been soaked, the enzyme inhibitors will actually block the action of your own digestive enzymes. So always with, with salt? Yeah, oh. I, I soak all of them. I don't soak cashews because they're not nuts. And yeah. they lose all their flavor if you do that. I, yeah. I do uh, dry them in the oven in any case. No, I don't eat raw cashews. Uh, dry them in the oven, uh, kind of, you know, just low heat, long term drying. Uh, but I do soak uh, seeds and nuts. When you do it all the time, uh, you really don't like the taste of them the other way. You know, they just taste yes, yes. bad. <laughs> yes, that's a, that I learned with macrobiotics, the, yeah. the soaking, but I had never heard about salt. Yeah. So, how much salt, like if I put like a bowl, yeah. With the, I don't know this this quantity. I don't know how it would be. Uh, well, I, I would maybe say a hundred a hundred grams or something like that. So yeah. how much salt would I put? Well, I do it by water amount. Like I would probably put about two teaspoons into a liter, which is close to a quart for those in the U.S. Uh, a liter or a quart of water. Uh, I put two teaspoons of salt in that water. It doesn't have to be the most expensive salt because you'll throw that water out after. But doesn't it uh, come into the nuts and the seeds? Not much, it, it, maybe a bit, but uh, you know, I'm just saying that because some people grown that you know they can't afford the expensive salt. They got to throw it out. Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't use, you know, Morton's uh, commercial salt either. But I just, can't, I don't, yeah. I don't get the. I get really good expensive salt that I use for my kitchen, and I use uh, a coarser kind of salt for the for the soaking because. I eat seeds and nuts regularly. I think they're important for having yeah. a balance. Like we saw before, like going three or four hours and getting hungry, that shows that the food really needs to be richer, you know, more substance. And uh, that's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's good. Well, keep going here. You know, it's, it's great that you're uh, you know on that path and uh, you just want to learn more about it all the time because, okay. uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is one of the great secrets of life is that... Uh, you know, with this kind of food, you can 
have good health and live a, to a ripe old age. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if, uh, you can... if something doesn't fall on our heads. <laughs> In Israel, Thank you, Selma. You did so well up until that. Yuta, Vanisha, please. <laughs> Yuta? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, thank you very much. First of all, it was a really interesting talk and topic. Um, and I just wanted to briefly um, follow up <laughs> on what Marion said because I, I have to pretty much the same problem and I'm also living in Central Texas, like the same problem about sleep issues. And I I had noticed before too if I put more protein in and fats in the diet that it's better. But I one of the things I recently thought about I go through phases where I can sleep and other phases where I can't. Um and like right now I can't. And I was thinking about how the environmental factors impact that because right now it's more of a um, humid climate again. We had a really dry summer, but it's more humid. And it really seems to me, for example, mold could affect my body, maybe get some inflammation. And it seems to me that that can impact the sleep too. Do you have any insights on that? Well, it's just, uh, it just you think the climate is uh, one of the problems that if you're in a different climate that you wouldn't have the, you have sleep problems too, sleep disturbances? Yes, pretty bad. And I live in this, I live in central Texas as well. I yeah. grew up in Germany. And I actually, when I'm in Germany, I sleep better than I do here. I also noticed my sleep issues really started when I moved into the big city, when I lived in the country. I live mm -hmm. more at the edge of the city. I slept better, which probably has to do with the, well, all the chaos in the city, but, but it's also late, darker um, when yeah. you're not in the city. And you, you take I, no caffeine, right? You take no caffeine, zero I caffeine. don't drink caffeine, but I do eat chocolate. So I, yeah. I have to cut back on that. Yeah. That's the, the scourge of mankind is chocolate. <laughs> mm. When I tell people don't eat chocolate, they say, oh, I only eat the pure, pure chocolate, you know, as if that's good, you know, that it's actually, it's in the chocolate itself. There's nothing good about chocolate. Uh, but uh, mm. there's enough caffeine in chocolate to cause sleep disturbances. So just don't touch it. Your ability to detox caffeine determ is determined by the strength of your liver. And uh, if your liver isn't good at detoxing, even a small amount of chocolate can affect you. So just be sure you just don't touch it because you, you know, you're just working against yourself. But uh, uh, there'd be the same kind of question here. You know, you know, there, there's so many environmental factors that can affect sleep. Even like if you if it happens when you move to a big city, it can even be the uh, the uh, EMF around you know, the electromagnetic fields. Some you know in Germany, you know that uh, Baubiologie, you know where they they uh, they build the houses so that uh, it will stop any kind of uh, electromagnetic radiation going through the walls. And uh, you know that kind of thing in a big city is important because the, the people around you their their homes will will affect you or the uh, the uh, the 4G, not to mention the 5G uh, radiation uh, towers that are up all over. So if you notice the city is more than anywhere else, I would I would look at that. And uh, I, mean, I have a hoodie that has silver threads in it that will stop EMF. So when I fly or anywhere where there's high radiation, I always wear this hoodie uh, to block that. You know, it's like it's the teenagers and me that are wearing hoodies. <laughs> okay, but coming back to my question, have you seen any correlation between like um like weather? Like I said, it it seems like when there's more humidity in the air, it's it's worse or something. Well, yeah, I mean, I have seen that sometimes, but it's always a question of what your own personal condition is. You know, like when okay. I look at you, I can see that your body is holding too much water. You know, like there's swelling around your eyes and between your eyebrows and eyes. And so you're you're doing something that's uh, throwing your body off because uh, when you're holding that much water, uh, it's going to affect the sodium content, for example. And sodium is really important for 
the balance with uh, potassium and potassium is you know, potassium and magnesium are the two most important minerals for having good sleep. Mm. So uh, like you eat lots of vegetables, I assume, right? I do, but I also I started drinking a lot more lately because I got really dehydrated and my right kidney started to hurt. And ever since I've been drinking more water, that went away. But yeah, I, I'm noticing I have... Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, if, if your kidneys hurt, it's a good idea to drink more. That's usually a sign, you know, that they need more. But your body's not dealing well with the liquid because, you know, it's holding it. And there's usually some kind of a mineral imbalance when that happens. Uh, have you ever had a hair mineral analysis done? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. As long as you I don't dye, it. yeah. As long as you don't dye your hair, you can do a hair mineral analysis, uh, and uh, that will give you a good insight into what's missing. But I, my gut feeling is that there's something missing here. Uh, you know, the your kidney, your kidney energy is weak, and um, you need to to work on that. Uh, which is uh, going to be the yang element. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's it's yeah it's it's hard to give advice here because of all the elements that could happen. But to answer your question, yes, uh, the the uh, the climate can in any case affect that. But see, we should be flexible so that we can adjust to whatever climate. I do that like you know flying back and forth between Australia and Scandinavia is like two extremes and uh you know i do that because my body's flexible and i don't notice it but uh other people you know, i i remember i used to be in switzerland and austria and they get something called fern you know which is this this warm wind that comes up from the mediterranean and so it'll be like just above freezing and then suddenly the fern comes and it goes up to 20 degrees which is like about 70 for the uh, for the fahrenheit people and uh uh at 20 degrees, and I think, hey, this is great. I can go outside without a jacket on now. I love it. And other people, it's, oh my God, now I can't sleep. And, you know, and, and uh, they, it's like horror for them. And that's because their bodies can't adjust. So yesterday it was cold, but today it's warm. And that adaptability is really one of the basic signs of health. And I think that's what you need to work on. Um, you know, your food is macrobiotic. Is that right? Hey, um, I did it for a while and I, I no, it's not really that clean anymore because yeah. I did have so many sleep problems and I started eating crackers and cheese, which actually helps sleeping. So there was <laughs> probably not enough protein and fats in it Yeah, with what I ate before. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that would be a good place to start there. Like, you know, your best chance of success is to create a solid basis. Like that means, you know, the macrobiotic food program and then build on that. It's like when I was talking to Michio, uh, not Michio, <laughs> Norio, and uh, said, uh, you know, that uh, it's really important that uh, you, uh, you you have this, this like a basis that, that works for you. And then you build on that, like, you know, macrobiotics is good, but it doesn't give you all the nutrients you need. And you have to be sure you're getting all of them. I think a hair analysis is a really good thing. I I recommend everybody that comes to me with with cancer uh, to get a hair analysis. And Texas has got the uh, the number one hair analysis lab in the world. Trace what Elements, is, Trace Elements Lab in Houston. Yeah. Expensive, but very good. And uh, then I think that would give you some insight into that. But uh, I would definitely uh, you know get off the cheese because that is uh, that's it's very hard for the body to deal with that. You know, it's just it's just dense stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had um, such bad sleep problems, and then I didn't want to. I took some, even some sleeping pills for a while, but I didn't want to do that anymore. And then I think I literally didn't sleep for a year. Just the really basic one and a half hours that the body falls into <laughs> mm -hmm. out of, um, yeah, out of necessity. So, and I'm sure that then we can every everything else in the body to the that lack of sleep for so long but yeah but well, you also have total black in your in your room when you sleep is that right there's no light coming in mostly it's i cover the windows with really dark uh, blankets so it's dark so there's a little bit through the door a little bit but the room is pretty much dark mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, see, you need more melatonin. If you can't sleep, you have a melatonin problem. They uh, they did an interesting study. They found that blind women have one third less breast cancer than women who can see. And so the question is, why do blind women have so much less breast cancer? It's because they have high melatonin levels because it's always black. So mm. you might even, you know, practice wearing a like one of these flight uh, eye patches around just during the day and not, not in the middle of the day, but when you're getting towards the evening so that, you know, it gets black much earlier and uh, like listen to music or do something you can do without looking uh, to try to maximize that, that black time and increase your uh, melatonin. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some foods that have melatonin. One thing that does help uh, many people is uh, barley grass, barley grass powder that you mix with water because there is some natural melatonin in, in barley grass. Okay. Well, good, good day, Yuta. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, now we have uh, both um, Michelle and Sylvia, right? So uh, which of you wants to slug it out? Any, either of you have a quicker question, quick question, so we can get to the other of you? Mine might be, but I, I'm okay if Sylvia wants to go. Go ahead, I, Michelle. You're okay, okay. <clears throat> the stage. So excuse my um, parents have been eating um, beet chips, organic beet chips, nothing like oh. them. It's very drying, I know. So quickly, I just want to say that uh, we haven't really been talking about what Steve has, and that is about facial diagnosis. And I started going to... Um, acupuncture and Chinese um, medicine because of I have a very drying condition. My lips were always chapped even even while I was practicing macrobiotics with Denny Waxman. Changed my life. My life improved much better. It didn't matter if it didn't correct everything. I just have to say it was um, changed my whole life. And um, <clears throat> but because I have very I think it's young tendencies. I maybe that's what it was. My tongue. Oh, okay. The beetroot chips are now on there, but um, has a big crack in it, which never looked appealing. So that I'm going to Chinese medicine. They're telling me I'm yin deficient, meaning blood deficient. They're using needles to help move my blood through me. So any thoughts on that, Steve? I know that you are you do kind of work with Chinese medicine. Um, you know, I like them. I'm studying Chinese medicine now as a side gig. I just became mm -hmm. a social worker. Any thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, well, I have uh, learned both the uh, oriental uh, facial and body diagnosis <clears throat> that we have in macrobiotics, but also the German naturopathic diagnosis. And with the tongue, I can do more with the German naturopathic because it's more of a Western oriented kind of thing. Like, you know, Chinese, you've got to really study, like, you know, it'll say, you know, you have wind in the liver and you have your spleen is moist. And, those, you know, that kind of thing doesn't say much to most people. But uh, that kind of a tongue that you described to me is a sign of a pancreatic deficiency in the German naturopathic diagnosis. And, uh, but you're, you're right, this is a yin deficiency, which is, means, that you need, uh, you know, the good, uh, the good yin to balance that out. It's, uh, you know, dry. So that's that's pretty obvious. And I think you know what you have to do. I just take a pressed cucumber salad, for example. You know, take, you know, you you slice uh, cucumbers, put a little bit of umeboshi on that, press them, and after a couple of hours, you know, then uh, they're soft. And that's that would be the ideal kind of yin that I'm thinking of. And then, of course, not eating the beet chips because they. You know, they're delicious, but uh, in your case, they're pushing you in the other way. <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's what you uh, you need to do. What, what do you have for breakfast? Oh, I used to be really good with planting vegetables, but mm, not so much. I usually have sourdough bread, which doesn't really have wheat, does it, Steve? <laughs> sourdough bread. W what's it made from? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's made from sourdough starter. Um, no yeast. I know I mean, that. Uh, what kind of grain is it? It's just uh, like normally it's, sourdough bread is usually made from wheat, but this is not, what is it spelt or what, what kind of grain is it? Interesting. It, you know, it's, uh, 
It was recommended by Denny Waxman. So I think that it's a better wheat, but it's probably wheat. It's probably wheat. Every sourdough I've seen in the U.S. is, is wheat. And so that'd be a good place to start because um, I, I mentioned before that uh, with many years of experience, uh, it becomes clearer and clearer that the gut is always the basic cause of our health issues. And uh, every time you eat a slice of uh, sourdough bread, uh, you're basically giving your gut a beating. No, sourdough bread? Yeah. Yeah, you, have, you, you should not take uh, wheat, but wheat in no form. Read the uh, wheat belly. But um, Oh, I thought that that was okay in macrobiotics, sourdough, because it's made from the hands. Uh, well, uh, macrobiotics itself isn't really a homogeneous program like that. That uh, they sometimes say it's like herding cats. You know, they, everybody just does his own thing, and uh, that's something that uh, I've become aware of because I deal with these issues uh, not just at the yin yang level, but what's actually happening at the biochemical level. And uh, wheat is definitely off the program. I, everybody who comes to me gets the advice: don't eat wheat, no matter what it is. I don't eat wheat. Happens twice a year, maybe when I'm traveling, you know. But <laughs> I just never buy it because uh, it's just it's just too much uh, burden on the gut. And in your case, uh, with what you're seeing on the tongue, the tongue is like a um, a reflection of what's going on in your digestive system. Basically, yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know what? I noted since oh. I've been on the mackerel, kind of like vegetables to the bread, more or less. Oh, yeah. yeah see, I that's it. Yeah, bread is a very uh, dry thing. Uh, Michio Kushi uh, would recommend that people steam the bread to take that excess yang out of it. You know, so if you steam it, you definitely uh, make it different. Now, there are there are other sourdoughs available. You know, I mean, they could make it out of spelt bread, but uh, or, or rye. But just in the organic food shops that I've been to in the states, I haven't seen them. Everything I've seen has been done with wheat. But uh, check it out, you know, because it, it usually it's in big letters if it's not, because a lot of people are looking for an alternative to wheat. <laughs> and I think, yeah, the first thing you should do is just cut out bread for a while. You know, not the rest of your life, but just for a while. All right. And someone did raise in the in the chat, they said that the the organic wheat is different than the manufactured wheat. So is are we talking, you're talking about all wheat, doesn't matter the quality. Yeah, the yeah, see, what happened was in the 60s, they hybridized wheat. And in the 70s, they introduced into the food supply. So today, almost all wheat is hybridized because it gives a much higher yield. And uh, the problem is that the kind of uh, gluten that is in the hybridized wheat is much more abrasive than the original wheat. There are a few idealists who still grow the old traditional wheat, but you have to be an idealist to do that because you just won't get as much uh, yield. Uh, that's that, first of all. And then the other thing is, if it's not organic, it's going to have a lot of glyphosate. Glyphosate will ruin the gut bacteria because glyphosate works like an antibiotic. In other no. words, yeah, oh, glyphos yes. yeah glyphosate. Apples, so, right? Yeah, so they, they hit the wheat first of all, with glyphosate, and then before the harvest, they do it again because they can accelerate the drying process so that they don't have to wait so long to sell it. So it's it's highly toxic. So, you know, even if you do eat wheat, never, ever eat wheat that is uh, not organic. Oh, and so I don't know if my bread's organic or not. So that's, that's right. Issue. Find out because even if it's got a nice picture of a farm and looks very rustic and nice, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's all just marketing. <laughs> and that, oh, that wheat is coming straight from, you know, if you look at the U.S. Uh, for glyphosate use, it makes me glad that I'm an expatriate, you know, <laughs> that I left the U.S. because there's no country that is so eager in the use of glyphosate as the U.S. Yeah, thank you, Steve. You're so helpful. I hope I, I, I'm going to stay in touch with you and maybe do a um, consultation. Yeah, great. Yeah, go for it. That sounds good. I think you picked up some things that are healthy because you're, no, you're not far from getting it. You just need a, a few points to break through. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, can uh, I do a question? So, no. Of course. Uh, Sylvia's <laughs> been waiting very patiently. So, let's do her first. Uh, 
Let's see. And Carol, of course, wants to speak. And who was speaking just now? Oh, that Some was Michelle. Oh, oh sorry. You... No, no. Someone just said, can she ask? Anyway, let's go to Please Sylvia. Stop. Sylvia. Sylvia, unmute. There you go. All right. So anybody's welcome to ask a question before I start start talking. Before your speech. Who was someone just uh, showed her face that can I ask and I didn't catch it. It was Lisa Amatista. Okay, so Lisa, is that you? Go ahead then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I am Italian, so maybe my English is not perfect, and I ask you sorry for this. And I'm a student of uh, Martin Alsey, so I knew Stephen because of my teacher. And um, I am also Buddhist, so I really thank you for this uh, lecture. It was great. Uh, my question is uh, this. Normally, when I start uh, macrobiotic, because um, I had a, um, uh, how to say, um, problem with the food, uh, bulimia, for example. So sometimes I stop with macrobiotic and I go back to a very proteic uh, nutrition. Um, now it's um, about one year that I started again, but normally I gain uh, weight with macrobiotic. So I'd like to know if the problem is that there are too many cereals, ca ca carbohydrate, carboy, how to say, Carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, if uh, there is a loss of uh, protein in the macrobiotic uh, program, because uh, as you said before, um, sometimes in the um, in the, the books of Ozawa, Michokushi, and so on, there are not uh, supplements, uh, but I started uh, to use it because uh, I heard your lecture with my teacher in the summer and you spoke about omega 3. So I, I I bought, I bought again, also vitamin uh, D and uh, B12. And I, I'd like to know what is your opinion about uh, protein, if it's uh, necessary to, to improve the, the level or um, if it's enough to eat uh, legumes and um, a wool uh, cereal. Yeah, you can, get enough, clear. <laughs> you can get enough protein by just eating legumes, uh, you know, uh, People eating vegan food can certainly cover their their protein needs, but they have to eat legumes. When I get invited uh, to eat a vegan meal, sometimes there's uh, brown rice and baked squash and steamed broccoli, but there's no uh, legume dish, and then there's not enough protein there. Okay, so, so it's, it's not a... necessary to eat uh, seitan or in Italy there are many f fake uh, meat uh, and. Uh protein products, and yeah. um, they don't know if it, they are good. I, I don't think so. Well, I don't eat seitan because it's concentrated wheat uh, gluten. You know, it's like okay. that's, that's like uh, bread a uh, hundred times stronger, you know, <laughs> you know, that concentrated stuff. I used to, I wasted some of my best years of my life eating seitan, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, what I like is tempeh, made from other beans than soybeans yeah, yeah. so uh, fortunately that's come along quite a quite a ways now you know in, in australia uh, it's easy to get chickpea tempeh black bean tempeh also in uh in europe so uh not so much in the us i found but uh you know i like that because people like to have a variety of foods and they get tired of eating beans all the time but i do eat fish i'm not a, i'm not vegan uh, I do eat fish, and uh, uh, I like fish, and I think you know it fits fits well with the way I do things. Fish doesn't affect the gut bacteria like meat does. It's, it has a more neutral effect. So if you know if you like if you know if you if you don't want to eat any animal food, then just have uh, legumes. That's fine. You know you don't have to. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, so that's uh, enough. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, I would I would not take seitan. Okay. Yeah. Legume, okay. what is it? No, I, I'd like to know why I always gain weight when I start again eating uh, uh, macrobiotic. So it makes me 
mm. feel bad with, with myself. So sometimes I go back to a protein uh, um, program. Well, you might need to eat more protein out of the food because weight gain, in your case, is probably a sign of elevated insulin. No. Mm. Okay. You know, high insulin because insulin is a storage hormone. So it tells your body to stop burning fat. So that's why when you eat protein, that uh, that and fat together, that stops the rise in insulin from the glucose of the carbohydrates. Okay, thank you very much for all the lecture. Bye. Va bene, molte grazie. Uh, Carol, you've been very patient. Um, and but Sonia, oh, there she's muted now. Good. Okay, never mind. Carol, go ahead, unmute, please. Carol, you have to unmute. There. Hi, Stephen. Carol. Oh, well, at last, yeah. you get to ask a question. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you so much. What an excellent talk. Just marvelous. Um, so I'm 77, and um, uh, my hair's um, uh, falling out more than usual right now, you know, in November. And... Um, of course, I'm concerned about that. Um, yeah, but well, you know. should be should yeah. be concerned because that's yeah. just an a, yeah. a, a external sign that something's not right inside. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, then the question is, what do you eat? Like, do you eat macrobiotic food or do you uh, walk on the wild side? <laughs> yeah, I I follow uh, you know the grains and the vegetables and the 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 tofu and beans. Uh, sometimes, though, I do sprinkle in some some meat, some maybe ground turkey, mm, occasionally some eggs. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, uh, lots of vegetables. Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of vegetables, cabbage and kale, and 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 you know watercress and uh, all those good things. Um, I made millet with uh, wild rice for breakfast. Soft millet with wild rice. Um, steamed uh, squash. How about seaweed? Yeah, I, I roll um, the uh, natto every morning because that's supposed to be anti-COVID. Uh, roll the natto in seaweed with a little bit of sauerkraut. Uh, what kind of seaweed? A nori. And, and then when I make the grains or the rice, I put that little postage stamp of kombu. Mm -hmm. yeah, postage stamp is not enough. Oh, okay. A lot more. So oh. My experience with, with hair loss a lot often is that people need to eat more seaweed and nori is nice, but nori is let's yeah. say the least the least effective of what you need. So you need to go with kombu, wakame. I, yes. I've had women tell me that when they go to their hairdresser, uh, they... Uh, they notice when they've started eating uh, seaweed-based food like macrobiotics that the hairdresser notices that their hair is getting thicker again. Wow. Okay. Definitely. So, yeah. That's so some... a postage side stamp that would be enough for one bite, but you need to have much more than that. You, I would have a combo every day. In your case, you know, if you have those yes. pieces that uh, you know they're chopped about this long in a, a little bag. Yes. I would do yes. probably. In a dried state, I'd have about half of one of those per day. Yeah. Okay. So when, yeah. When it's soaked, it's got to be much bigger, of course. Mm hmm. Yes. I do the night eating. Uh, it's it's a super bad habit. And um, I eat late and and it's just I'm, I live alone and it's really hard to break that habit and to get on that normalized um, eating at night, you know, eat at dinner at six and the bigger meal at noon, like you were advising the other woman. So the big meal at noon, and well, for me, do you think lighter at night? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, definitely. You you can't really have a healthy uh, digestive system if you eat a big meal in the evening. It's just uh, not I possible. Know. But I think one thing that might help you, aside with these things we're talking about, is that if you took BioSil, you know BioSil is a supplement that's sold in the organic food stores. I've heard you say that by, I think I heard you, it, it's in the organic bio cell. Yeah, yeah. They, have both, 
They have capsules and liquid. I think the liquid's a better deal. They have a 30, 30 mils. And then just, you know, it tells you on the label how to do that. But that is one of the best ways to like immediately do something for your hair. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. B-I-O-S-I-L. That's it. Oh, perfect. And the hair analysis, haha, -ha, for me, maybe, um, is in uh, Trace Minerals in Texas? Yeah, in Houston. Trace Minerals in Texas. Best best lab in the country. It's not the only good one. The Smoky Mountain Lab in Tennessee is also good. But uh, since I was talking to the woman there in Central Texas, I mentioned that yes. uh, that's, that's, yes. uh, they have the, the best reputation uh, for you know being exact. But it's certainly not the only good one. Yes, and then the oil that you recommended for us um, when you said um, more protein from beans and legumes um, and more oil, what did you mean, like what forms of oil? Well, I would always take oil in the form that it was eaten traditionally. That means olive oil, of course, from the Mediterranean area uh, right. and uh, coconut oil, which uh, many macrobiotic people have a, a problem with that, but I find that it works really well. It also has a long tradition yeah. and uh, it's not like eating coconut. It's an extract, just the oil. And uh -huh. uh, and then uh, the other is the sesame oil. But I I have tahini quite often. I make tahini sauces and tahini for different you know spreads and things. So I don't have sesame oil that way. I stick pretty much to uh, olive and uh, coconut oil. So yes. on salads, I put olive oil, and when I fry, I tend to do a mixture of olive oil and coconut oil. Oh, that's a nice combo. Yeah, olive and coconut. Yeah, nice. the, the coconut. And, yeah, and that's so important what you're telling us. Um, and the, the 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 blue. Oh, um, and the vitamin D for nor for like us, my case, like five thousand. I found that um my my D level was sixty and. I don't think I was absorbing the D. I, I like it to be about 80 because I think it's so important, your vitamin D. Uh, so should I, I did get some uh, fermented uh, uh, cod liver oil. Yeah, that's good. But I would take vitamin K2 together with the D. Yeah, yes, you yeah, do that. absolutely. Well, I did, but I didn't think that particular brand I was absorbing that well. So do you have a brand of D and K2 that you recommend? Well, if you eat natto every day, you're getting enough K2, so that's okay. Oh, okay. All right, perfect. Yes, excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, yes, just, excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank great. you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn and Sylvia, finally. And then um, let me say, after Sylvia speaks, I'm going to leave the program running. If anyone has comments, questions, you don't need me anymore to allow you to call in. You just go ahead and, and join in, okay? Sylvia. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephen, for bringing in the topic of minerals. You know, I, I'm listening to issues of cancer, food sensitivities, hair thinning, insomnia, kidney disease, weight gain. Each one of these at baseline is a reflection of the sodium to potassium balance in the body. When Osawa was 18, when he was diagnosed with tuberculosis after a younger brother had died from it and his mother had died from it, when he stumbled on a book by a d medical doctor trained in German medicine named Sagan Ishizuka, he stumbled on this book in a used bookstore and he followed the teachings of sodium potassium balance and he extended his life from age 18 to age 72. Osawa taught us that if we want to make the kidneys strong, if we want to make ourselves brave, if we want to have even a fractional amount of common sense to walk through the landmine, 
that we've created for ourselves before we knew, or the landmine created for us by factors outside our control, like the 5G and 4G and 3G and so on, the heavy metals, the man-made pollutants in the environment, in everything and everyone. That we do this by paying attention. Osawa taught five parts potassium, one part sodium. The kidneys can work with this, even though they have to maintain at a minimum one part sodium to each two parts potassium. They can work with one to five. They can maybe even work with one to 10. But this thing where people are eating one to 40, one to 50 in terms of sodium to potassium, because really they have no idea about the mineral basic components of the food they're eating. They're not looking anything up. They're assuming that, oh, everything contains some sodium and potassium. But even the animal food is mostly potassium rather than sodium. Normally it was always cooked with salt or cooked in seawater to make it balanced so that it wasn't a hazard for the kidneys. So, in my own experiments with myself, with the bodies of people that were dependent on me like children, or my mom in her old age, or clients, I have found that paying attention, first of all, to the sodium potassium balance of the diet is the clue to correcting issues with insomnia, for instance, the adrenal glands making too much cortisol that keeps people awake so they can't stop thinking and go to sleep. Well, yeah, but why is the adrenal making too much cortisol? It's doing this because chronic sodium insufficiency is a stressor. It's a life-threatening stressor and the adrenal can't stop doing, doing this. And so when, when you correct this, when you add sodium, to the diet in rational, physiological, meaningful, biochemical amounts. Uh, 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 what, one of my people went from waking six times a night to not at all, sleeping straight through. And I know with myself, I, I, I normally sleep straight through six to seven hours, but I know how to screw this up. And it will be with excess potassium, inadequate sodium. On, on the issue of why do people feel better when they start eating animal food, again, animals contain sodium. This is a necessary, essential mineral for the animal kingdom, not essential for the plant kingdom, but for the animal kingdom we have to have sodium in ratio to the potassium. And so when we start eating animals like the cheese, the yogurt, the bone broth that makes people feel better. Yes, it contains salt. And the salt makes it, the chloride makes it so they can digest their food. The sodium is critical in the active transport of all the breakdown products of digestion from the gut into the blood. So, sodium is the active transport for glucose. For most of, for, for, for critical minerals like calcium. And so, and so as soon as they uh, start eating animal food, they, they're getting more salt, they're digesting better, they're absorbing better. And yeah, they're gonna feel a lot stronger. And, and one of the reasons why, if you're not into animal food, you don't want to go Oh, okay. I'll clarify this. In terms of the use of land mammals and their milk, one of the reasons you do not want to use them if you're not thinking or finding them to be beneficial already would be that all of them are atherogenic, carcinogenic, 
and inflammatory for us because all of them, the milk of every mammal, not human, and the meat of every mammal contains a specific sialic acid molecule that humans stopped making two to three million years ago. And when we stopped making it, then consumption of these foods became uh, antigenic to us. It, the, 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 they can eat each other, but we can't eat them. And therefore the groups that ate the smallest amount of the land-based mammals and their milk were the groups that had the least heart disease the least autoimmune disorders, the least cancer. And I know, okay, I'll end it there. S sodium to potassium, this very much matters. This is the basis can I, of everything. Can I jump in with a question for, for you, Sylvia? There's um, the eons old, decades, I don't know, years old, system in making an animal food kosher is to wrap it in salt completely. They have these big, huge vats, of course, or what we call kosher salt. And they take the chicken and they just completely wrap it in salt, in this coarse salt. And I always thought, wow, a young animal, and then we're adding young salt. And I thought, ooh. And what I want to ask you, Sylvia, what you just explained about the potassium sodium. So does that practice make sense to you? Uh, it's like brining and we use brining even for fish. So brining poultry makes sense. It's similar to how Cornelia Ihara prepared poultry for high holidays like Thanksgiving. So I, I can see, and it, it would be a kind of purification. And it would help balance the food because in my understanding, the salt would pull out some of the excess potassium in that food. And if you look at the mineral analysis, even for the different animal foods, they're typically more than five parts potassium to each one part sodium typically. Now well, there's there some are, there's well, some exceptions like egg, I believe is one to one, if I remember correctly. Hmm. One part sodium to one part potassium. But so that's actually affirms the original identification of egg as the most young of the animal foods. And what would be the effect of draining out the blood from the animal? Taking out, say again? Drain the blood from the animal. Draining of the blood, well, that would be very yinizing because the blood contains the sodium. The cells of the animal are, contain the potassium and a tiny amount of sodium the blood contains the sodium and the chloride and a tiny, tiny amount of potassium blood and cells. And the part of us that are the cells, the part of the animal that are cells is the part of us that belongs to the plant kingdom. Okay. Our blood is powered by salt and it's what makes us animals. Okay, well, um, you guys are on your own. Is there anything else, or shall we wrap it up? And well, I yeah, uh, I I have to go now too because I got <clears throat> an important thing to do tomorrow. But I said there are fifty three questions, or there are fifty three comments. Maybe there's some questions that maybe somehow we could uh, deal with those in some other way rather than now. But uh, you know, I'd be happy to. To uh, deal with those questions sometime so we could. Uh, well, if you'd be happy, write me an email and then I'll put them in my newsletter. Okay, well, let's do it that way. Then everybody can get the that's answers to those questions. Thank uh, you, Gina, for doing this every every month. Thank yeah. you, thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. And thank yeah. you, Stephen. It was so interesting. Great.
It was fun doing it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate both of you. Thank yeah. you both. In that case, let's all pray for peace. This is oh region. yeah, world peace. Let's really do it in our region, my region. So thank Amen. you all very much, Sylvia. Did you have a closing comment? I wanted to say that the sodium potassium pump, which was discovered in 1957, was the beginning of the confirmation of Ishizuka's theory. And a Nobel Prize was awarded in 1997 in chemistry to the researchers in Denmark who, who elaborated on how the sodium potassium pump works to maintain the difference between the blood and the fluid inside the cells. And they have since proven that all cellular functions are dependent on the function of the sodium potassium pump. So in 1997, a hundred years after Ishizuka published his first book, 1897, on the sodium potassium theory, was soundly confirmed this is the basis of all health. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. As always, you are a scholar and a, what do they say? A gentleman? Gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank everyone for listening, for commenting, for participating. We had a great turnout tonight, over 50 of us. Mm. 60 at some point. Yeah, very nicely done. So, Steve, this is not the last time we'll hear from you, hopefully. Great. And, uh, we are 55, actually. At the moment, yeah, yeah. yeah.